Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie show on the planet Earth, the John Campia Show, coming from right here on my YouTube channel, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around to talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and a whole ass load of DC stuff. We're glad that you're here today because it is game day. game day. James Gunn has made his announcement. <laughs> so what's coming? We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. I'm joined in the room by Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Back there, of course, we got Ray Aura. Taylor Gonzalez is back there helping out the guy running the show here today, Jonathan Voico. And beside him, we've got Aaron Cummings and Joey Bishop is here looking as enthusiastic as ever. <laughs> uh, and most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, making this show part of your day. And here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to break it into two parts. In the first half of the show, we're going to talk about some predetermined topics. Then in the second half of the show, while normally on an open mic day, we would just take our member chat questions. It's a little bit of a special day today. So we're going to open it up to, to Super Chats to everybody. So we will open up the Super Chats. Once we get to the end of the main topics, we'll announce when we are doing that. Also, a little bit of housekeeping. Don't forget, guys, if you need your audio-only version of our show, we do have the John Campia Show podcast form. Just go on to your favorite podcasting app of choice and subscribe to it today so it'll be there when you need it. All right, guys. With that down... Let's get into stuff, some stuff here, shall we? Now, before we get into the, the plethora, if you will, what is a plethora? Uh, <laughs> bonus points to anybody who gets that. I know it. I, I knew you would know it. <laughs> hey, before we get into the plethora of DC stuff, uh, there's an interesting thing that kind of came out here about this, and, and that is this. You know, Last of Us right now is kind of tearing it up. Um, it is. It has been a highly anticipated show, mostly for me because the amazing was coming in from Chernobyl to run the show. And Chernobyl's probably the best miniseries I've seen in over a decade. So really excited about what he would do with such a great base story with The Last of Us. Well, it has been a ratings darling. It had set a bunch of HBO records for its debut. Then it set another HBO record for the biggest gain in viewership between episode one and episode two of a show with a 22% jump. And now, according to the reports here, that gain has only continued as according to Variety, The Last of Us viewership has gone up from episode two to three, another 12 percent, which means that whereas the first episode of The Last of Us started with uh, 4.7 million, the latest episode in it's just its first 24 hours ended up with 6.4, another 12 percent increase, adding nearly a third of the viewers from the people who watched the original thing. This is, obviously, this is a symptom of positive word of mouth. This is a symptom of people watching it, loving it, talking about it, and that motivating other people to go, I guess I better get on board with this thing. Because that has been the word. And I guarantee you this. After episode three, I, am, I will guarantee, I will guarantee another viewership increase going into episode four. Uh, I don't know if it'll be 12%. I don't know if it'll be 20%. I don't know if it'll be 8%. But you are going to see another significant bump because episode three was one of the single greatest episodes of television I've seen in a long time. And again, I know it's beating a dead Netflix horse, but this once again speaks to the fact that dropping all your episodes at once, while it is fun for us bingers, while it is absolutely fun for us bingers, I absolutely agree with that, the reality, the week-to-week -week episodic releases works for your show infinitely. There's no, there's not even a debate anymore. There, there's just, there's no valid argument you can make about how it's better for the show. It may be better for me as a binger, you as a binger, but it is not better for the show to not do week-to-week -week releases. And we're seeing that happen. And I think, you know, by the time we get to the final episode, we could be watching this thing pulling in 10 million, 11 million per episode. And don't forget, these are only numbers in the first 24 hours. Like the actual numbers of the people who watch the original episode is in the double digits now. A anyway, Rob, you hear about this. Surprised to see this steep growth still happening. Not surprised. And what do you attribute it to? No, I mean, I, I, look, I think like we've said from the beginning, this is a very high quality. Here's the thing. Whether you love the show or tired of it or not, The Walking Dead has been a phenomen phenomenon as far as AMC is concerned. You've had multiple spinoffs. People are clearly digging the post-apocalyptic milieu, coming on the heels of COVID and 
war in the Ukraine and economic uncertainty and all this craziness. The, the collapse of civilization is in the zeitgeist, however you present it. And when you see it done HBO style, brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, brilliantly produced, people are going to be there for it. The Walking Dead became boring. Now you're watching a show that is dealing with societal collapse with love and emotion. <laughs> <laughs> whether it's between Joel and Ellie or whether it's between Bill and Frank. You know, I mean, it's people, this is an emotional show that's dealing with emotional bonds and you have clickers. I mean, yeah, I, I, mean it, I, I think that <laughs> this is exactly the kind of show, look, you can make people watch anything if it's well done. And and like the game, um, this is extraordinarily well done. And and the writing and the acting and the, the visual effects, the production values, the HBO of it all. I mean, I think the show's only going to grow in stature the same way. You know, people are starved for smart, emotionally engaging entertainment. I agree. Yeah, That's what people want. It doesn't matter what genre it is. And, you know, whether it's superhero movies, whether it's comedies, whether it's dramas, whether it's romance. I mean, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the new season of You. That looks <laughs> to be interesting, too. I mean, that's what people have always wanted. And The Last of Us, what's great is The Last of Us is also exactly why... We have such IP-based entertainment now. People want IPs that are proven in one medium. The problem is translating them to another. But when you have a Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann, the creator of the original IP you want to translate, well, that's a winning combination. Proof's in the pudding. Aaron, you know, you're seeing these number increases again, 22% from week one to week two, another 12% from week two to week three. We've grown about a third of the original audience. What do you attribute this to? It's exactly like you said, the word of mouth is spreading almost like a contagious patho uh, pathogen that infects ants and can destroy their species. Uh, just as it is spreading through this community, the word of mouth is spreading uh, to the viewers. You know, and Tom and I, it's, I, I love watching the show with Tom, my husband, because he played the video game and he loved the video game. And for him, he was really excited to find out how Bill and Frank are going to show up in this show. And, you know, we've talked so many times on our show about how the video games don't always translate to the movies. But a lot of that really does not depend on the IP and it doesn't depend on the movie. It depends on the one very essential ingredient right in the middle, and that's the translator. The translator is the one who is responsible for how the story is picked up from the video game and told to an audience who may or may not be familiar with that video game. So for me, someone who's never played Last of Us, I don't know how Bill or Frank showed up in the video game. All I know is that I'm watching a beautiful story that is heart-wrenching and emotional and also... I see Nick Offerman's character and I go, I know guys like that in Michigan. Like, <laughs> I know those guys, those survivalists when he first comes out. And then to take the story, flip it on its head, give you something you weren't expecting so that the guy, Tom, sitting next to me goes, wow, I never saw that in the video game. But what an incredible interpretation of who these characters could be in a real world scenario. And so for Craig Mazin as the translator here, I think that we're really seeing what the essential ingredient is. And for anyone who has the IP of a video game and wants to translate it into a movie or a TV series, you got to find yourself a Craig Mazin and that's how you're going to get, you know, a, a winning product. You know what else I have to say? And, and this is just a little thing and I didn't say this on our after show. We now know that you have to pair a rabbit with Beaujolais. <laughs> but the thing is, the brand of Beaujolais that they used in, in the show is a real brand. Oh, yeah. I Please. love it. It's very it's good. It's a great brand As of wine. As soon as I saw the bottle of wine, I was yeah, like, I, I, I that's, drink that. And, so, that and, and what I was wondering, because, you know, you can't just put a product in a show. And yeah. I'm sure that that line isn't in the video game, is it? Like somebody, no, I don't, you never actually meet Frank. You see Frank in the video game. Yeah, you never there's meet never Frank a time in the when game. they ever yeah. say pair. No, because Be in the video game they went in different routes. It's yeah, like they a different went in universe. But, but, where but I was else wondering, I, was that a last of us thing I missed? Because the thing about it is, somebody, maybe it was Craig Mazin, took the time mm -hmm. when they wrote that to get that brand of Beaujolais. Uh, their Pouli Fousse is really good too, and I was like, okay, they didn't have to do that. They could have had some empty. It's that attention they, to detail. And like I, when I, so, you talk about the translators. Matt Weiner, the creator of Mad Men, 
he had that attention to detail. You know, it's it's called, as you know, Greeked. We have to Greek something. If you if you have a label, I don't know that. Term. Oh, in the art department, if you have a label that you 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 Greek it so it looks like Greek writing or something. Oh, I see so what you, you can't mean. Read yeah. It. So like when they, you, yeah. So uh, they could have easily Greeked that wine label. They could have created anything in two didn't. seconds. But to have the the spe the specificity is great. All right, guys. Question is for you. The Last of Us just continues to keep gaining more and more viewership. It's the best thing on TV right now, even better than my beloved Yellowstone. <laughs> Whatever you guys think about this, what do you attribute it to? Jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's do another off the top here as we get into some DC stuff here, shall we? And that one is this. Now, on top of the James Gunn announcements about all the upcoming movies, which we are going to get to all that in, in just a second here, <clears throat> there were a couple of other interesting things that were said uh, in this report and in this video that Gunn put out and that was released in all the major trades. And one of the things is this. We've been talking a little bit lately about, hey, remember the Batman? Brought yeah, that was a pretty good movie. That made you a pretty good amount of money. Where the hell is it? Like, how come we... Why are we talking about... Matt Reeves doing a, what was a Buster Douglas? Buster Keaton. Buster. I keep wanting to say Mike Tyson's old opponent. I don't know why I keep Buster saying Buster Douglas. Douglas. Buster say Keaton. That. Maybe it's the only other Buster I've ever heard of is Buster <laughs> Douglas. But hey, why is Matt Reeves talking about that when he said he doesn't even have a finished script for the Batman yet? What's going on? Focus. Focus, Matthew. Focus. Well, apparently, one of the things that James Gunn and Peter Safran did let out was the fact that the Batman 2 actually now has an official release date. Mm. The Batman 2 is going to be released on October 3rd, 2025. So we're talking about two and a half years from now, which is not, not a completely unreasonable amount of time. I mean, I would have liked it to have been a bit shorter, but two and a half years from now, the next Batman movie comes out, which, which tells me that Matt Reeves has to be close to the completion of this thing. Because one of the things James Gunn said is, we're not going to be setting release dates until we have finished scripts. Well, then Matt Reeves' script better be close to ready because they now have a release date for this. Look, The Batman was a movie, and we talked about this a lot, that had a lot of uphill battles it had to fight, right? Number one, it was coming across some unpopular feelings about the, the, the state of Batman, right? I, I mean, there was just that. Number two, it had to fight a basic state of confusion. That's maybe some people would be confused. Well, wait a minute. I thought Ben Affleck was Batman. Wait, is this the Batman that just helped Superman save the world? Is this a different Bat? So there was a little bit of that. Number three, you all know what I'm going to say. Twilight, boy. <laughs> they had they they had to get over this, this, uh, this stigma that some people who haven't watched a single thing that Robert Pattinson has done in the last decade, because he's turned in some incredible work where the all Robert. the major directors want to work with him, like, Christopher Nolan and things like that were lining up to work with them. But still, that was another uphill fight it had to contend with. On top of that, for box office success, it was clearly from the marketing, it was a darker and heavier thing. Not something you necessarily take Junior to go see. And yet, in spite of all that, for its first outing, the movie cleared $700 million, became absolutely beloved by most people who saw it. Not everybody, all film subjective. But by most people who saw it, we got this incredible Colin Farrell Penguin series coming, which I am very excited about. And now we've got a release date. Rob, how significant do you think it is? Is it on this? Because I think, you know, it, it's it, there was a possibility and a risk here that in announcing all of my new films, they could have overlooked the Joker movie. They could have just swept that under the rug, which, by the way, also has its release date. They could have overlooked the Batman. That's not really my my administration's movie. They could have swept that away, but instead they made sure they paid some Which attention to this and give it to it. What do you think? Happens all the time in Hollywood. Yes, it does. You know, they could have got, but but I think they did, again, I thought this announcement 100% down the line was incredibly smart for a number of reasons, which we'll get into. Well, let's stick to the Batman but stuff. Th but this in particular, to announce an official Elseworlds label. We've talked about it. We've said yes. many times that that was a way to go. They have said both of these movies are branded under the DC Elseworlds label. They'll probably have their own, kind of like how Fox Searchlight had the Fox logo, but it said Fox Searchlight. They'll have a, a derivation of the DC logo. It'll say DC Elseworlds. I mean, and that's, again, that branding they're taking from the comics, that'll be a buzzword that people will, that's a fun thing. Ooh, it's a DC. Are they going to make another DC Elseworlds movie? And, and they've also 
well, I, I guess I can't, I won't say it in this portion. They confirmed another project that has been in development for a long time with another filmmaker named J.J. Abrams that could <laughs> also be a Elseworlds movie. So we've got Joker and Batman, which makes sense. And another film they say is still in active development, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later, that is also clearly an Elseworlds movie, which I think is really good because that allows them to make anything. If a filmmaker comes in and they said, look, we've got a great script. If a filmmaker comes in, if James Cameron comes in and goes, yeah, you know, I always wanted to make uh, an Etragon movie. You know, Chris wants an Etragon movie. He wants to make an Etragon the Demon movie. That could be an Elseworlds movie, or well, it doesn't have to be, but it could be. And that's really cool that they have a brand like, you could have filmmakers that can now go, I want to make a DC Elseworlds film of this character. I think it's great. And mm -hmm. and they've already got their two movies dated. So Elseworlds is a real thing with a slate. Now, see, that's This is something I have been whining and crying about for a long time that I wish Marvel had the testicular fortitude to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. By coming out and like codifying it and saying, hey, not only does DC now have, for the first time ever, have its own creation studio, we are creating division within its, its own label, DC Elseworlds. That's, that's been my thing. Listen, I love shared cinematic universe, but you guys who've watched me for any period of time know that the, the issue and the problem with shared cinematic universe is the fact that a lot of creative stories have to be punted because, mm -hmm. well, it doesn't fit in with what our current universe is. By specifically saying we have this label, you're exactly right, Rob. What they are telling is all creatives out there, hey, if you've got a great idea for a great story, like a one-shot, two-shot story, don't worry about the fact of whether it fits into our cinematic universe or not. Give us your pitch because we want to put out great movies. The Joker was fantastic. I can't wait for the second one. The Batman was fantastic. Can't wait for the second one. And this, you're so right. This opens so many of those doors. And not only that, John, they've got two slated movies with release dates that are guaranteed money makers. There's, there's no risk involved. I mean, unless, you know, a musical Joker movie with Lady Gaga, maybe there's some risk. But I think that I want to see that. And they're coming off a billion dollar gross. And with the Batman, a $750 million gross, that's a great way to start a label. And not only does it encourage creatives to jump onto the DC train, it encourages movie viewers, you know, people that are not, I mean, you guys are, I'm not going to be telling you anything you don't already know, but how many times have we heard people say, you know what? I don't even, I don't know what's going on in Marvel. I didn't see this movie. I didn't see that movie. So I, it's just too much. I don't even want to go see it because I More have people to, than you think. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, there are a lot of people out there who don't, who just feel like it's too much and they're not going to know what's going on. So they just don't even want to try. They're like, I'll just go see something else. If you can say to your friend or to your partner or whatever, hey, we're going to go see an Elseworlds movie and you don't have to have seen any of the other DC properties to know what's going on because it doesn't have to fit with, you know, every other movie. You're not going to be lost. It's a standalone movie. That's something that really could be the thing that pulls someone in and makes them realize, oh, wow, I want to see more of these movies and then could just broaden your audience. It's a really smart strategic move, you know, for, for getting new eyes as well as getting new creatives. Henry Cavill and Superman Red Sun. I, I mean, yeah, I'd be all for it. I mean, I mean, how cool would that that's be? That's the only way you can do Red Sun is if you do it as an Elseworlds label. Yeah, you I do it as an it. Elseworlds movie and you hire Henry Cavill to be the Superman from Russia. I'd be all oh, for it. Oh, Matt G in the chat just, just said something interesting. He also said for those actors like a Joaquin Phoenix who don't want to sign on to a 10-picture yep, deal, yep, yep. you're going to be able to get some really high-caliber actors that you would never have imagined doing a superhero movie because they're like, oh, one and done? I'll sign on for that one yeah. and done and maybe a second one, but I'm not contractually obligated. Yeah, let's try that. And, and that opens up a talent pool that you wouldn't necessarily have if you have to think about your shared universe. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a story about an older iteration of a character that people aren't necessarily going to go see, or you want to do a, you do animal man as a lower budget film that could be part of Elseworlds or something that might not fit in. It opens up the rest of the DC pantheon to be viable in terms of making films. All right, guys. Question is for you. We've got official release date finally for the Batman in the last part of 2025, about two and a half years from now, looking forward to it. But we also now have the heads of DC saying we have got an official label now, DC Elseworlds, where we can tell some of these outside of the continuity stories. I think this is fantastic. I've been begging for the studios to do this for years. 
What do you guys think about this? Whatever your thoughts are, jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, let's get on to another sort of off the top, I suppose. And that is this. Sticking in the world of DC here with the announcements that were made today. Before we get into the new stuff, there's some references being made to some of the existing stuff. One of the things in particular that we looked at with great interest is what Peter Safran and James Gunn would say about The Flash. And they said a couple of really, really interesting things about The Flash movie. One is this. Let's go over to my screen on this. James Gunn briefly mentioned Flash. And that is not... You might have to reset that because that's not my screen. Oh, okay. Um, there, there we go. go. James Gunn said this in talking about the upcoming Flash movie. Now, remember, we have heard that this movie is great. We have heard both the studio and David Zaslav say, we're thrilled with this movie, that's fine. But we have also heard from some internal channels that the movie's actually looking phenomenal. Well, James Gunn, clearly as the new boss of all things DC, has seen the film. And James Gunn said this, I will say here that Flash is probably one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. James Gunn is saying, a movie he didn't make, and that was not made under his watch. He didn't have a hand in it. James Gunn is saying, I will say here that The Flash is probably one of the greatest superhero films ever made. Now, one other thing he says that's really interesting about Flash is this. Uh, those being Shazam, Fear of the Gods, The Flash, the latter which Gunn says resets everything. There has been a lot of talk and speculation about The Flash movie amongst fandoms and us here about... What are the ramifications of Flash going to be? Is this like a pure Flashpoint kind of reset? Is this a whatever? And if we, obviously, there's still a lot of ambiguity. We still don't know for sure. But I think it's really interesting that James Gunn is saying here that this Flash movie resets everything. So we could look into that a lot. We can probably overanalyze that statement. The, the one for now, because we can wait and see on that, the one for now that I'm most interested in is, is his statement saying that this is one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. Again, I would take that with a giant grain of salt. He is still the head of DC, but this was a movie made not under his watch. He had no hand in the creation of this movie. He had no hand in the shepherding of this movie. And he's coming out and saying, this is one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. Rob, you hear statements like this. Are they overhyping this, do you think? Do you think we could be in for a movie that's really that special? And and what do you think he means by saying this will reset everything? Well, first of all, you've got Andy Muschietti who who came he did, you know, he did that horror short, then he made the feature length version of it, then he got to go do it one and two, which made a lot of money for the studio, learning his craft, cutting his chops, making a studio picture, well, two studio pictures. And then he or three, really. And then he does a flash, big genre, temple property. And I would expect, because Warner Brothers likes him, that he would have turned in nothing less than a great movie. And apparently we have heard nothing over the last two years other than the fact that Flash is great. And that they had their issues. Ezra Miller comes back. Obviously, they turned in a great performance. And they, as the Flash, both apparently as the hero and the villain, they did a great job, despite everything else going on. So... What's great about this movie is it is based on the very thing that led into what DC's new 52 did flashpoint lead into the new 52 or was it the end of the, I forget, but the, they're doing the same thing with this movie. They're, they're actually transitioning out of the old regime movies like, you know, the Zack Snyder justice league trilogy. Um, and they're making it canonical, which I think what a great idea. And we know they've done some reshoots. They did some reshoots over the summer. We saw even uh, Jason Momoa on set with Ben Affleck in his trailer or whatever. We know that they've probably made some adjustments, I would think, to help that transition. So I think it's genius because what they've done is they've used this Flash movie as a way to reboot their universe, just like they did in the comics, which I think is pretty neat if they do it well. And I think that... What a perfect canonical way to do that. So at least that's what I would imagine they're doing. And that's that means, like they say in the next paragraph, it leads leads to the opening that these characters, they can reboot anybody. They can bring anybody back in different iterations. Right. 
which I think is, is again, they're leaving their options open, which is really cool. Uh, now, by the way, there is this headline that you probably saw on the screen, and we can bring that back up, Jonathan, about from Variety, talking about James Gunn saying that, uh, or we can go to my screen here. Okay. Uh, saying that the you know that the flash is one of the greatest superhero movies ever made now i know there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna focus on this thing this part saying ezra miller's dc future decided after the recovery all right now this is specifically what is said and i'll tell you exactly what it means so uh peter saffron is talking here he says e ezra is completely committed to their recovery saffron said and we are fully supportive of that journey that they're on right now when the time is right uh when they feel they are ready to have the discussion We'll all figure out what the best forward is, what best path forward is. But right now, they are completely focused on their recovery. And our conversation with them over the past couple of months, it feels like they're making enormous progress. I'll tell you exactly what this means. Ezra Miller's never going to be the Flash again. We are not going to make that announcement right now. When number one, we have a movie that we're trying to promote, and we don't want any sort of cloud hanging over it. We want it to be just like they did when they had a movie with Batman coming out and they refused to tell the world that Ben Affleck was not going to be Batman anymore after it. I told you guys that, but they refused to tell people. They, they decided to pretend like it was, and I get it. That's the right PR move. It's the right PR move. But for anybody concerned about that statement, the other reason this is an important statement is because, I mean, you should say exactly this. You should say, look, Ezra's focusing on their recovery. That's exactly where the attention should be. We'll worry about this other stuff later. But, I'm going to tell you right now, that decision's already been made. That decision's already been made 50 times. So you We're, don't think that they are potentially waiting to see how well the movie does and then based on that? like, So you're saying that you don't see any path for Ezra to be in a follow-up? I don't, and, and I'll tell you why. I feel like because, you're about to give me a spoiler because you're holding on to spoilers. No, 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 no spoilers, <laughs> but, but I will tell you why is because I believe this is a movie because I think most of the average movie going audience is very rational, very think this was a movie that was shot before Ezra Miller started getting themselves in trouble. And when I say getting themselves in trouble, I don't mean, Oh, that rascally little scamp. I mean, grooming a young girl to the point that the parents are filing restraining orders, yeah. people having their bedrooms broken into people having their houses, bro people having chairs thrown at them, like women getting choked in the streets outside a club. Now, this is not stuff you can brush under the rug, but most people are rational, sane people who understand this is all stuff that happened after they made, the, after they shot the movie. The movie was shot. I mean, there's nothing Warner Brothers could have done about that. It, it, Warner Brothers still should have addressed it two years ago under the old regime, but they didn't. So we're here now. So I think they understand that that can happen and this movie can still be a big, tremendous success. It is a, as the Wizard of Oz would say a horse of a different color, though, for to ask fans to be more understanding of, well, now we're going to bring this individual back. Mm -hmm. I Because I think they know the backlash against that, even by some of their most hardened supporters. I think Warner Brothers and James Gunn understands the backlash against that would be tsunami-like. Mm -hmm. um, now you can say, and I have said on this show before, you know, the average general movie going fan doesn't follow variety, doesn't watch the John Camp show. Maybe they don't even know about it, but I'll tell you what, they're going to be a lot of people who make sure the public does know about it. Yeah. And so I think this movie can be a tremendous success. I hope it is. Cause I heard Andy Mush Remember this is not Ezra Miller's film. This is Andy Muschietti's film. And I, I, what all we're hearing is that Andy Muschietti has done a tremendous job, but make no mistake. There will not be more Ezra Miller. Now, full disclosure, James Gunn didn't exactly send me a DM on Twitter to tell me that. This is just me, you know, putting, you know, constructing it all together and putting the pieces together and say, look, there's no way they're going to bring Ezra Miller back. But nobody at DC has told me that. So that maybe maybe they are that stupid. Maybe they are, they are that simply that incompetent even still, and they're that dumb, and I have tremendously overestimated James Gunn. But... There's no way. And they're going to continue to say statements like this. This statement that Peter Safran just said is the perfect statement. It it puts all the attention back on the movie. It says, ah, we just want Ezra to worry about, you know, getting better. But make no mistake, we're not going to see Ezra in this again. I, I know, Rob, do you, what do you think? I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I tend to agree with you. Unless it makes, 
I mean, the thing, here's the thing. What they're doing with flat here's the thing, here's the thing. What they're doing <laughs> with this movie is using it as the fulcrum to move into their new universe. So in a way, they have a perfect out. The universe has been changed. Mm -hmm. Flash is no more. At least that iteration of the Flash is gone. There is a new iteration of the Flash in this new universe. And I think they've given themselves, again, a canonical way to get out of any future Ezra Miller Flash movies if they so desire. And I think that's part of the genius of using Flash truly as the Flash point of this new universe, just like in the comics. Because if by some miracle or something happens and they get to come back if they get to come back also a canonical reason flashpoint change the universe just like they will be a changed ezra miller uh, th but no. you're right about like it being an andy muschietti film yeah not an ezra miller film and unlike when robert downey jr you know who also had trouble at one point but over a long period of time, resolved his own troubles and then made a comeback eventually. Um, this is a this is very recent, and the big push is not going to be having Ezra Miller, you know, coming out at Comic Con, you know, in Hall H and doing all the press. Like they're going to focus all of their press on uh, Andy Muschietti. They're, he's not like he's going to be the one that's front and center is Andy Muschietti. They're not going to be having Ezra Miller parading around to a bunch of press junkets. So I think that you're right. It will be uh, the Andy Muschietti movie. Because and not is, what a lot of people will say is, well, John, what if the movie makes a billion dollars? OK, let's say it does. Question. Does anybody believe <laughs> Does anybody believe <laughs> that if this movie makes a billion dollars, does anybody on planet Earth believe it'll be because of Ezra Miller? No. Nobody believes. Ezra Miller is not a box office draw. Ezra Miller is not a huge. Ezra Miller is, an, in my estimation, personally, Ezra Miller is an extremely talented actor. But let's not pretend that Ezra Miller is some big A-list star that people dole out money to go to see. If this movie ends up making a billion dollars, because I'm going to tell you what, as, just like Aaron just said, Ezra ain't going to be on the press tour. If this movie makes a billion dollars, it's going to be because of Andy Muschietti. It's going to be because of his team of writers. It ain't going to be because of Ezra Miller. And mm -hmm. I, I think Warner Brothers is smart enough to understand that. And, and yeah. So. By the way, hats off to them because the way they promote this movie is this is this is the ending of one phase of the Warner Brothers pantheon of superheroes mm -hmm. and the beginning of another. I mean, this they have been given a gift that they've actually, not that they expected to do this, but the new regime is like, yeah, we're excited about The Flash. It's the doorway to <laughs> our entire reimagining of the DC <laughs> Universe from the ground yep. up. It's a genius move, and I'm sure they're going to lean into that. Because that way, you know, if somebody criticizes, if you want to be critical of supporting Ezra Miller or releasing this movie, it's the end of one era and the dawn of our new era. <laughs> What a great, what a great PR flip. Meanwhile. Well done, Warner Brothers. <laughs> Meanwhile. All right, guys, question is for you. I, I think these are some stunning statements. James Gunn, who had no hand in creating this Flash movie, says this Flash movie, straight up, one of the greatest superheroes movies ever made. That just goes along with a lot of stuff we've been hearing for a long time now. What do you think about that? And him saying that this is the thing that resets everything. It's given James Gunn, apparently, and Peter Safran the door they wanted to kind of take the DC universe and make it whatever it is they wanted to make it. What do you make of those comments? Whatever you think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, before we get into the full list of all the new projects here coming, we're going to take just a quick second here and thank one of the sponsors of our show. There are a new sponsor around here, the good folks over at Fume. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Fume. Be smart. Don't start. Kick the habit. Put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a hundred times, and yet we still continue to have bad habits. Today's sponsor, Fume, is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. You see, Fume is not a vape. It's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Because instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals like a vape, 
Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. And Fume's new version 2 model is snappy and tactile. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will always have something to do. The device itself is really attractive, and once I popped in the core and took my first inhale of it, it tasted fantastic. Guys, the easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one, and Fume is designed to perfectly do just that. So head over to tryfume.com and use the promo code CAMPIA to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version 2 Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfume, T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use the code CAMPIA to save an additional 10% off your order today. And thank you to our friends at Fume for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show. Remember, guys, when you support and try out our sponsors, you're actually supporting us. So make sure you go down to the description of the video and right near the top, you'll find links and promo codes to all of our sponsors. And thank you again to Fume. All right, let's get into it. I, coming into today, was kind of thinking three or four projects. Then I heard like some reports saying it's going to be two projects. And we heard some apparent insiders say it's going to be five projects they announced. Well, everybody was wrong. It's like 10, 10 projects. That is just what James Gunn calls the first part of part one. And it's, it's the phase has a name. Oh yeah. Gods, Gods and, and monsters. monsters. Mm. Great. Which is a tremendous name for a quote unquote phase. Again, it's all arbitrary, but still a great name for a phase. So let us start digging in here and start going through the stuff we are going to get. And we can go over to my screen there if you'd right. like, Jonathan, so I can uh, scroll us through this. We're going to start here with the movies because there's a bunch of series and there's a bunch of movies. First movie up they're talking about, Superman Legacy. It's got a release date. It's coming out before, before the Batman 2, coming out on July 11th, 2025, which again is about two and a half years from now. That movie's going to come out. Superman Legacy will mark the start of the DCU, as Safran put it, but it will not be an origin story of the proverbial Man of Steel. It focuses on Superman balancing his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing, Safran says. He is the embodiment of truth, justice in the American way. He is kindness in a world that thinks of kindness as old-fashioned. Gunn is writing the project, and Safran says he hopes Gunn can be persuaded, perhaps, to direct it as well. Look. We all, we've been saying for a while, we all believe James Gunn is going to direct this film. Of course film. he is. Especially if it's the one that's kind of kicking off the series and all this kind of stuff. I I did not think that they would announce a casting today, but I still thought there was a chance of it. Like if I had to put money down on it, I, nah, I didn't think they would name the, the actor, but I thought there was a chance. They'll, so, they'll save that for Comic-Con. Think so? Yeah. Yeah, because James Gunn's a Comic Con veteran. He's been going there for. He is. He's a big Comic Con for, guy. For the better part of thirty years, he'll they'll announce it at Comic Con. They'll make a huge big deal about it. Well, Rob, let's let's talk about Superman Legacy for a second. What do you think? The title. What uh, well, direction do you think they're going to go? What do you think? I think it's incredible because I think it's an incredible title. And what Peter Safran said that Superman is a man of kindness in a world that thinks kindness is old fashioned. Yeah. Mm. I think that what a genius approach to this character that that somebody from off world is the only person that can really appreciate humanity and realize what humanity maybe has lost. I love this idea because you know what this it, it what this says the word legacy doesn't mean it's about the next villain Superman's going to fight. I mean I'm sure there's going to be a villain, but it's going to be about what Superman's place in the world because this Superman movie is going to set the tone for every, what is the universe they're making? You know, they're, this Superman movie, all these other characters are gonna exist in this universe, so they've got to set the tone. And that's what James Gunn's doing. He's setting the table with this film, and Superman is the man to do it. Superman is, he's the, he's the lord of the DC manor. You know, you go all the way back to the 30s with Superman, and whatever hap happens here is where this universe begins. It's the tone of this universe, and hell, hell, the next movie you make, you make that whatever the Batman movie is. He's the he's he's not Superman, and you know whether they've got. I think they have a really great list. The characters that they've announced, which we'll talk about, are it's going to be interesting to see 
how they fit into the world that Superman is going to define. And one of these movie projects I am over the moon about. I'm so excited about it. I can't. Right. I can't. I also think part of this thing about the idea about he embodies kindness in a world that looks at kindness as old fashioned as maybe a little bit of a response to some of the reaction the previous Superman got. Because, you know, I, you've pointed out many times, well, I am a, I'm the world's biggest fan of Man of Steel. I think it's one of the greatest comic book films ever made. But a lot of people reacted a little bit negatively because as you, if you pointed out before that they, they were looking for something a little more joyful. They wanted something that was joyful in the movie, you know? Something that, you know, a, an aspect that, say, Shazam did actually really, really well or, you know, um, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies or something like that. Now, we saw the Henry Cavill iteration of Superman start to evolve to coming into that, right? But it sounds like this might be a little bit of a, of a reaction to that as well and, and probably one that's going to be very well received by a lot of people. And it, now we are going to sit down and whether it's going to be Comic-Con or something else, we'll sit around and wait now for the next thing to well, come up. Also, that artwork that we're using there, um, I love the a Superman for All Seasons graphic novel. I have often said that the way to, that's that artwork is from a Superman for All Seasons. And the thing about a Superman for All Seasons is it encompasses the entire Superman pantheon. Luther's in it, Crypto's in it, the Fortress of Solitude. And I'm like... They didn't call it a Superman for all seasons, but in a way, that title is what what is in that graphic novel. And if he used that graphic novel as a touchstone to establish Superman, we're going to get a very special movie indeed. Right. Now, as we move into the next one here, it's important to point out that James Gunn talked about the overall story of Gods and Monsters. And with a lot of them touching on how each one of them will individually kind of have something to do with the overall story. The first one he kind of mentioned that with was with the next project, which is the authority. Dude, I've had, I, which I've I knew you would, myself. I knew you would be excited when they announced the authority. <laughs> so from global fame to relative obscurity, Superman legacy will lead directly into the authority an ensemble movie about superhumans who have a less than idealistic approach to saving the world. You know, there's a little bit of Kingdom Come sounding philosophy stuff in there. Uh, Gunn spoke at some length about the authority, a project that he says he's really excited to bring to life. The characters come from Wildstorm, which was launched in 1992 as an independent entity under the current DC Comics uh, uh, chief Jim Lee and ultimately made an imprint of DC. Now, here's the thing. So basically the authority on its surface sounds a little bit like a number of things we've gotten. It's, there's a little bit of Suicide Squad sounding in there. There's, there's a, a lot bit, of the boys. I was going to say, there's a bit of the mm -hmm. boys in there, all that kind of stuff. A group of superheroes who are like the ends justify the means sort of philosophy. But I knew you'd be excited about this. Tell everybody why. Aliens, super technology. You basically have two characters that are Batman and Superman that are in a relationship with one another. I mean, but what I love about the comic, I have the absolute editions of the, the first authorities. They were big, bold, giant scope in scope storytelling. They were irreverent, mean spirited sometimes, but action on a massive sci fi scale. Even the comic panels are huge, the way they were first drawn. And these characters, in a way, they they're not it's not as nasty as the boys, but it has, let's call it a very irreverent attitude. But what's interesting about the authority is you could say that in a way it's kind of a prototype justice league so the the authority is something the justice league would want to not be so and the authority is you know they're not exactly the most moral people and i loved this comic because it kind of in my mind it was a super science version of the justice league that was a lot more grounded in the modern age very postmodern and I think what's going to be really interesting is they're going to use the Justice League to be a counterpoint to the authority. This is this is later stuff, but yeah, I mean... But what do you think he means by the fact when he says that Superman legacy will lead directly into well, the authority? Well, beca because I think that the authority will already be a super team that's that exists here already. Right. And Superman's going to come in and go, uh, yeah, no. Now, there's something really interesting here that Saffron says as well, a comparison he makes. I like this. You can bring this up, Jonathan. He says, uh, added Saffron, they're kind of like, I love this illustration, they're kind of like Jack Nicholson and a few good men. They know <laughs> that you want them on the wall 
Or at least they believe that. Uh, dude, see, this is why... This you is, need me on that wall. Uh, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> that's, what the, that's, what, that's what Apollo, who is basically the Superman character, the authority, would tell Superman. Because you know what? It's great. That analogy, we're going to get that, and I'll tell you, the authority and Apollo, that's somebody who can take Superman on as a villain. They're setting up that conflict, and, and they're giving you who these villains, I mean, the authority is going to, they're going to be the bad guys. They're going to be the bad guys, and it's going to be glorious. All right, let's move on here to the next project that, I'm not going to lie, made me raise my eyebrow a bit. The, but I think a lot of people are going to be excited about this. The Brave and the Bold. Again, we are talking about the feature films here. This is going to be a feature film, as was The Authority, Superman Legacy. These are feature films coming. Also, The Brave and the Bold, along with introducing the DC's version of Batman. So this movie is going to be it. We're going to get our new Batman in this movie, who will exist separately from the version played by Robert Pattinson in the Batman movies, which is, of course, going to be DC Elseworlds. The Brave and the Bold will introduce the Bat family, Gunn said. First among them, here it is is Robin, who is returning to fully live-action movies for the first time since 1997's ill-fated feature, Batman and Robin. This version of Robin is Damian Wayne. Gunn describes him as our favorite Robin, a little son of a bitch, an assassin, and a murderer. Da Damian Wayne is, of course, Bruce Wayne's biological son. In fact, unknown to Wayne for the first eight to ten years of Damian's life. It's a very strange sort of father-son story about the two of them, Gunn said. All right. So this tells us a couple of things. First of all, I have, let's get this out of the way, elephant in the room or, or you know, pig in the room. I, <laughs> I have never been for, and I think there's a reason for why the last 24 years we have not had a live action Robin is because the Batman, that we, the, the Batman, the Dark Knight Batman that we've been wanting to see on screen is not a character that takes a nine-year-old child with a stick into fighting criminals with, right? That is just not, that doesn't go along with the, the imagery and our ideal of Batman. He's a loner, Dottie, a rebel. <clears throat> What's that? <laughs> He's a loner, Dottie, a rebel. It, yeah, it's, That's <laughs> a Warner Brothers movie. They could fold that into the that, It could be part DC of the show. Universe. It could be part of the Elseworlds thing. Yeah, there you go. Pee Wee Herman shows up. Here's the problem. Or here's the thing. Damian Wayne is a very, very different Robin from, say, your Jason Todd's, from your Dick Grayson's, uh, from uh, who's the one who became Red Robin? Uh, uh, Jason Todd. Robin. What's that? Jason Todd. Uh, no, 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 not Jason Todd. Um, um, oh. He became Red Hood. Uh, oh, that's what. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 why am I freezing? Um, it's my, uh, it's my uh, Tim, Tim Drake. Drake. It was Tim Drake. So the Tim Drake Robin is like, there is, there is a definite more lethal side. He's not your kid who's like, gosh, golly, Batman. Like he no. was raised very, very differently. Right. And has a very different kind of mentality and outlook on life. Now, I'm going to be very, very curious to find out how old are they going to say Damian Wayne is? Are they going to say that Damian Wayne is 11 and 12 years old? I don't think so. In which case, I'm going to roll my eyes. Yeah. But they go 14, 15, 16 year old Damian Wayne. Uh, again, I've always said this. I'm all for bringing a Robin in if you don't do it quite accurate to the comic books and the animated stuff. Age him up a little bit. Don't make me feel like Batman is an irresponsible asshole for dragging a child into fights with criminals. But if you do that, Damien, Damien is quite an interesting way to go. Plus, it also sets up the opportunity down the road for Red Hood. It opens up the opportunity for Nightwing. It, because you're saying there have been these Robins that have come before. But here's the interesting thing about that. And, and I, this is interesting. We have been assuming... I have, you have, a lot of us have been assuming that since they're going to go with a little bit of a younger Superman, like, you know, mid-20s, maybe late 20s Superman, we've been assuming that they would probably want to age match with Batman, right? If this is a Batman that has already had Dick Grayson, that has already had Jason Todd, that has already had Tim Drake, and now is discovering they've got a son that might be 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, this kind of hints, I would think, do you agree that our this Batman is going to be a little bit of an older Batman? What do you think about totally this? Totally agree. 100%. It, look, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I, mean, he I don't says, want to get too excited. He says Batman family. Yeah, the Bat family. The Bat, the family. Bat family, which, of course, you're talking about thing like 
uh, you're talking, well, dip, by some definition, you're talking about Azrael. You're obviously talking about Nightwing, talking about Huntress. You're talking Batgirl. about back. There's a whole plethora. Let me, let me ask this. Totally don't actually think this is the case. I Let me be clear. I don't think this is the case. But if they are going to go with a mid-40s, whatever, Batman, any chance Ben Affleck sticks around? I, I don't think so. I don't think so either, I, but I come on, give me some hope. I think he's going to direct this movie. Wouldn't that be oh, cool? Oh, I would love that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's. I think as gonna... good as ba as good as Ben Affleck is as an actor, he is a brilliant director. And be if you if you don't know what I'm talking, like Argo just says it all. I still, and the reason I think that is because I think they can adapt the script that they already have that Ben Affleck wanted to do with Terminator, Deathstroke as a villain. They put him in there because you can you can you can tell this. The thing about what's interesting about the original introduction of like, like Deathstroke and Teen Titans. You know, he had his own. He had Tara uh, infiltrating the Titans, and there's an info. There's a really interesting dynamic there, and I think that if Ben Affleck directs this, they can easily put the Dame, uh, the Damian Wayne storyline because what a really cool dynamic that we've never seen before. The problem with the Batman movies that we've got is it's Batman looks for looks goes after criminals, and in in Batman Forever, and then with Robin and then Batman and Robin was done badly. I mean, the world's different now. The dynamic with Batman having Damian Wayne involved is you've got a whole new dynamic with Batman that you've never looked at. And I think Ben, ben Affleck's going to direct this movie and they might adapt his Terminator story. Now, again, to be clear, I do not believe Ben Affleck is going to be in this movie. Right. Obviously, not. I'm just saying, hey, if they do make, if this is a Batman that's already been, maybe he's the right age. That's just me being. I mean, and by the way, as, as far as cinema history, you have an actor who's portrayed Batman, who is a huge Batman fan, who's developed a Batman script already to direct. That some people inside of Warner Brothers say is the greatest Batman greatest, script ever yeah. written. Yeah. And, and he comes back and he's already a director that's made four movies at Warner Brothers, one, mm -hmm. one best picture. If I was Ben Affleck, I'd be like, sign. he's, you know what? He's probably already signed. They're just not going to announce it yet. Why? Because the script's not ready. Now, for those of you who don't know, James Gunn has already yeah. said publicly that they would love to have Ben Affleck direct a project for them. It's just a matter now of finding the right fit. What's the right project for him? He could be playing coy. Maybe it's the Batman. I, I'll, listen, I'll be down for anything Ben Affleck directs in the DC universe. But, oh my God, if they could find a way to take that Terminator script, that ter Batman Terminator script, and work it into their gods and monsters overall storyline. I mean, because they don't say anything about the villain. No. You know, they they, they say, now we're going to add the Batman family in this because the, the conflict is still the same. You just add the Batman family element, and that's they change the script around. But that's what Warner Brothers does. They've taken scripts that exist and reworked them because they've already paid for that script. Would it make sense if Damian Wayne, it's so hard for me not to say Damon Wayans. It's I so hard. Me too. I, 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 <laughs> like I'm, I'm fighting saying that every Buster Douglas. Come on, Aaron, <laughs> homie, don't play that. Would it make any sense to the comic book gods over there on the other side of the room for Damian Wayne to come in as sort of the the his lost child that comes back and he's you know, like troubled white male youth and he's getting in all sorts of trouble and then uh, his dad, Batman, comes in and kind of like helps him find his way and makes him into Robin? That's, like, an that's or, not, or does that completely... No, that's not tremendously unlike uh, basic, the basic themes of, of the thing. It, yeah. Again, it, a lot of it's going to depend on how are they going to age Damien? Um, how far are they going to stick to the roots of the, you know, with the Al Ghul heritage and stuff like that? Are they going to stick to that? Are they going to play around with that a bit? A lot of questions up in the air, but they again, did say Batman family. Yep. The bat family is going to be the entryway into the bat family. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to get bat family hang out in the hall of family. <laughs> we're going to get Nightwing. <laughs> they didn't announce it today, but clearly by saying bat family, we're going to get Nightwing. Huntress is a really cool character. I, I think Huntress is going to be a lot of, anyway, guys, what do you think about the sounds of, uh, uh, the brave and the bold? Uh, let us know in the comments. All right, let's move on to the next one here. And what, by the way, what a cool title. Yes. Not Batman, but the brave and the bold. Is that not the, the name? Brave brave and the bold. Is that not like a car animated? Yeah. That's the name of their animated things, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It'll probably be Batman, brave and the bold, but still, uh, I want, I, I should point out one thing. You know what they didn't announce? Somebody oh. sent me this link earlier today. Somebody sent me a link earlier today. Well, it was last night. Sent me a link to a video I did in uh, 2014 where I basically said, we were talking about Batman Beyond. 
And I said, I guarantee. I said, you know, whenever you say someday could, it's the answer is always yes, someday it could happen. But I said, I guarantee we are not going to get a Batman Beyond in the next 10 years. Uh, they sent me the video clip of this. And I'm, well, this is going into 2025 now. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, who knows? But there's no Batman Beyond announcement, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> wouldn't be surprised Whoop if we, under too. James Gunn, Comic-Con. under James Gunn, hey, for everybody who is wanting a Batman Beyond, it has never been more possible than under James Gunn. Yeah, and Michael so, Keaton is Batman. It's the Ex- Elseworlds movie. They yeah. haven't announced yet. Just not going to come, come anytime dream soon. Dream the impossible dream. All right, well, dude. <laughs> All right, we need to move I'm on. Yeah, let's keep going here. We get into the next project they happen. announced, which on its surface sounds iffy, but I'll tell you what, it got me interested, and that is Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. Based on King's comic run of the same title from 2021 and 2022, Woman of Tomorrow features Superman's cousin, Kara zor who, as Gunn explained, is a very different type of Supergirl. I love this paragraph. Listen to this. We see the difference between Superman, who was sent to Earth and raised by loving parents from the time that he's an infant, versus Supergirl, who was raised on a rock chipped off of Krypton and watched everyone around her die and be killed in terrible ways for the last 14 years of her life. Gunn called this Supergirl a much more hardcore, though King's series also involves Crypto, the Superdog. I don't think we're going to get Crypto in this. Joey Bishop. We totally (laughs) are. But I'll tell you what, I know a lot of people got their backs up a little bit when they heard that there was going to be a Supergirl character in the Flash movie and all that kind of stuff. I, the way, because I was, I did not read this comic run, right? The way Gunn describes this, I'm like, oh my God, a Kryptonian, another Kryptonian coming to Earth with a very different upbringing. Because in many ways, our perceptions of Kara zor have always been just a female version of Clark. You know, all about the kindness, truth, justice, empathy, standing up. But to have this character come from something, to, I think this could be interesting. What do you think about it? Well, now, what I find very interesting about this is there's a Supergirl in The Flash. Which I just mentioned. Maybe they've already cast her as this Supergirl. You think it could be the same one? I think it could be the same one. <laughs> It'd be interesting, though, that they wouldn't announce that casting if they already have her in the DC. I, well, I think the reason, again, they they're they're announcing these things. I think they have talent, probably, with what they're saying about the Supergirl movie. I mean, from the way she looks, I love the costume. I love the design. If she's great in the film and it's Flashpoint and all that, I mean, she probably in the movie comes from a different universe anyway. Right. I would imagine. So it would be, again, it's a great, you've got, she's already launched in The Flash. And if The Flash is as good as she, or they think it is, you set her up, Flashpoint happens, she's whisked away to her old universe or whatever, or a universe that happens to be the new DC universe. That makes a lot of sense to me. And that way, you've already got a character cast that people are excited about because they dig her. And it might be coming off of a well-received movie, so... We'll see about it. Anyway, I love the sounds of this Supergirl. So, yeah, guys, what do you think about Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow? All right. The next up on their feature film list, and out of all the ones that I thought, well, Rob's going to love this, this is the one that we got. Swamp Bro, Thing. Come on. <laughs> They're going feature film with Swamp Thing. Easily the most extreme example of James Gunn and Peter Safran's conviction to diversify the DCU. Swamp Thing will investigate the dark origins of Swamp Thing, Safran said, though the prism through the prism of horror. Now, mm. Gunn said something very interesting in his video about this. He kind of suggested that Swamp Thing is going to be kind of separate from the DCU but will still tie into the story. Which makes sense. I'm not really clear how that is going to manifest itself, but Rob, I know you were one of the people I know. Uh, Chris Carr has been another one that has been extremely enthusiastic about getting Swamp Thing on the big screen. Obviously, they tried a little little something-something with with TV. Didn't go so well. They canceled it after one episode. But under gun and the fact that they say they want to take this in a horror route, what do you think about the sounds of Swamp Thing? Hello, James Wan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. he's going to do this. He, he the, the ill-fated show that got the short end of the stick, the, the fact that they're not doing that Trench Aquaman series. Are you kidding me? James Wan was born to make this movie. Born to make this movie. And gosh, who's producing his li- new film? He's got this, oh, I don't know, he's following up Aquaman with another Aquaman movie. And who was his producer? Peter, Peter Safran. Safran. 
You think they didn't call James Wan and go, bro? Oh, and by the way, who's James Wan's current business partner? Oh, a little guy by the name of Jason Blum. Mm -hmm. Don't call him little. Who, who knows a little something? <laughs> knows a little something about horror. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just saying. I just uh, I, if James Wan directed a Swamp Thing movie for these guys, I mean, come on. He doesn't even have to leave the lot. He's in his Aquaman post production suite right now. I'm just like, let's just transition it over to Swamp Thing. <laughs> by the way, yeah. James Marsden in the live chat just threw in a, a name. I, I love, oh yeah, yeah, yeah happen. I saw that. Guillermo del Toro to direct a Swamp Thing. Well, movie. that's that would be a, another, yeah. Fuck me. I yeah. can't, I can't, like that would, look, I don't think that's what they're going to do, but how, how crazy appropriate would it be if they got Guillermo del Toro to direct a Swamp Thing But movie? they've got, I mean, James Wan is a billion dollar director for Warner Brothers. Yes, he is. And, and I, I, and I'm sure he's still pissed about what happened to his Swamp Thing produced TV series. You know? Well, I, I'm sure nobody was happy with how that all no. turned out. But like how... How do you see, first of all, there, the iteration of Swamp Thing in the Harley Quinn animated series is great. I don't know if you've seen that one, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. But how do you see Swamp Thing being, I mean, it's hard to say because we haven't actually seen this new DCU manifest yet, but how could you see it tying in or, or well, fitting in with this universe? The thing about the Swamp Thing and the whole the green and all that is an incredibly powerful, multi-dimensional uh, part of the yeah, well, DC. He's considered one of the most powerful beings. Yeah, the on DC the planet. universe. And again, he's a character that can flit from the Elseworlds universe into the DC universe if he needed to. Right. And I think that one of the things, again, the Swamp Thing run that Alan Moore did, coming on the heels of of uh, people that came before him, that Swamp Thing run that he did is the one of the definitive comic runs ever, not just of the '80s, but ever. You know, I've recently been reading. They've they've re-released his run in in absolute editions, and it's and not only that, who crosses over with Swamp Thing? Everyone from John Constantine, the Phantom Stranger. There, there's so many other DC characters that they can spin off out of Swamp Thing. I think it's a great move. I'm surprised though that it's not part of the Else World, especially because it's considered. It's they're saying that it's going to be a horror film. What makes this part of the mcu store uh, dcu sorry 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 <laughs> yes um what makes this part of dc versus being part of the elseworlds yeah i mean that that's the thing right because james gunn said in that video it's like it's he's kind of separate from the dcu but it does play into the overall story yeah, because there's, it's gonna be there, interesting to see yeah mm -hmm. there are characters i mean people like i mean everybody from shade the changing man to kid eternity i mean there are there are characters that swamp thing interacts with like he's not in metropolis Mm -hmm. You know, right. he's off in into the dimension, like he, the swamps of Louisiana that are the focal the point. Bayou. Imagine like if the, the my, if, if in walking, I mean, uh, the last of us, what if Earth eventually became a living brain because the mycelial network? Uh, imagine Swamp Thing That's is swamp the thing. apex yeah. of yeah. that network. So he's everywhere all the time kind of a deal. All right. So that's the feature film stuff that we're looking at as just part one of phase one. Uh, which is Swamp Thing, Supergirl, uh, Woman of Tomorrow, The Brave and the Bold, and The Authority, and Superman Legacy. All right, now let's get into the HBO series stuff that they're going to be doing. And we're going to start things off with an interesting, an animated one. Creature Commandos. Dude, come on. Now, this is interesting um, because it is an animated thing, but James Gunn has said, well, number one, they reaffirmed that everything is going to be tied together. Other than the stuff that's going to be under the DC Elseworlds label, everything's going to be tied together. The animation, the live action, the shows, and the movies. And James Gunn said that voice actors we use in animated will be voiced by the people who are going to use as the live action versions of those characters as well. Mm. And there's a little line this that I think Ray Orr is going to love, but we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Creature Commandos, the animated series for HBO Max is the very first project greenlit by Saffron and Gunn, who has written every episode. So Gunn said in his video, I wrote this whole thing. The show is already in production. The Creature Commando characters were first launched in 1980. The premise features Frankenstein's monster teaming up with a werewolf, a vampire, and a gorgon uh, to fight Nazis in World War II. It doesn't appear that Gunn's version will take quite the same approach. Weasel who everybody loved. Uh, Weasel, one of the characters from Gunn's 2021 film, The Suicide Squad, is one of the commandos, along with, here you go, Ray, well, Rick Flagg's father, Rick Flagg Sr. And I <laughs> wonder get off my lawn. if they could possibly get, uh, what's the name Joel of the actor? Kinnaman. Joel McKinnon. Uh, McKinnon. When he Joel comes back Kinnaman. from the moon. 
if they if they really, can get Joel Kinnaman <laughs> to play Rick Flag Senior in this. Uh, but listen, this Creature Commandos is one of the probably the one name on this whole thing that I really don't have any familiarity with. What do you know about it, and what do you think? Well, it's, it, look, it's they, they've done iterations of this before. It's just a lot of fun. You know, it's literally those monsters. I mean, imagine what it is. It's it's a derivation of the classic Universal monsters, or the Hammer horror monsters. I would imagine more Hammer, but going to war. You know, in World War II, because those monsters. If you think about the Universal monsters in the 30s, you know, Frank. What if you could get Frankenstein's monster with, and and it, we need you. We're going to war against the Nazis. Okay, Honor. you know, well, I mean, I can. This is the most James Gunn thing I can possibly imagine, and I love it. I love it. I mean, they don't necessarily have to make it. Uh, I mean, come on, look at this. They don't have to make it World War II. They can do anything, but it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. And again, these characters, these monster horror characters, would later tie into Swamp Thing. Can later tie into the Dark Justice League. If they did that, that's what Guillermo del Toro wanted to do. This is all good. Now, by the way, Gunn also reiterated about this thing, that this is going to start laying groundwork for what the overall story of Gods and Monsters is. So, again, hyping how that also animated, big on there. All right. I'm needing that to be a live action because uh, Miss Thing in her red shirt with her ponytail, um, I'm just saying, let me know when the auditions begin. Well, hey, they, they, he did say they're going to take these animated characters and transition some of them back and forth in between live action and anime. And Medusa's so, gun, I'm into it. Never like, know. all of these characters, I need to see this live action. All right. I'm so annoyed because DC Comics keeps dropping these images, but after we cover it, like literally we move on and then they drop the image. Like, oh. oh, that's great. But that wow. was for Supergirl. That image was actually out earlier today. I saw yeah, that one but earlier I mean, like, today. Jonathan. On Twitter. On Twitter oh, on their, it did show up yeah. on Twitter. All right. Next up for the series stuff. We've got a show that's been in produ been in wor the works for a long, long time. We knew it was coming. Waller. Based on uh, Olivia... Uh, uh, um, why am I freezing on Olivia's uh, name? Uh, Viola, Viola Davis. Davis. Not a, I was oh. thinking uh, Octavia Spencer. Yeah. I, was, no. I was crossing Octavia Spencer and uh, Viola Davis yeah, together. Yeah. got Olivia. So uh, Waller's come back. With Gunn focused on Superman legacy for the foreseeable future, season two of Peacemaker has been put on hold. Instead, team Peacemaker will appear alongside Viola Davis as a continuation of the show, Gunn said, which, spoiler alert for season one of Peacemaker, ended with Waller's daughter, uh, Leota, um, outing Task Force X and Waller's role running uh, running it to uh, running it to the world. All right. So this is where things get a little bit foggy for me, to be honest with you. And I wish they had addressed it a little bit more. In the question of like yesterday, Dave Batista said that he, by the way, Dave Batista did not say James Gunn was completely restarting, was completely resetting the thing. He said, I feel like James is doing this. But anyway, is this a reset or not? It's, it's still kind of ambiguous because while we're still going to have Peacemaker apparently, and we're still going to have Waller and it's a continuation of the Peacemaker story. What does Flash reset? And what does it not? Now, maybe we should talk about this later, but it now seems like we should be focusing on Waller right now, but it does seem like a good time to bring this up. Because James Gunn and Peter Safran also said, hey, the door is open for guys like Zachary Levi to keep playing Shazam. They didn't say he was going to. They just said the door is open, that Gal Gadot could still be playing, the door is open for her to keep playing Wonder Woman, that the door is still open for Jason Momoa to still be playing Aquaman. And so... With the Waller situation, it, it does bring up the fact that this is, even after this announcement today, how this film is a reset, reboot, soft reboot, what is still the same, what is different, is still as kind of nebulous as anything to me. And as a Henry Cavill fan, you know me, I was like, hey, listen, I'm all okay. I'm the world's biggest Henry Cavill fan, but I'm okay with recasting him if you're resetting the universe. I get it. I totally get it. But there are going to be some whiny butt hurt people like myself, uh, Henry, Henry Cavillites like me, that are going to be whining and crying and complaining, as I'm about to do, that, well, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you can bring back Zach Levi, 
who I love Zachary Levi, by the way, if you can bring back that person and you're saying the door's open for that person to come back and Waller's still here and blah, wait, why, why, why is Henry Cavill not Superman anymore? Like, I, I get it. You may, well, we want to go a little bit younger. Okay, but that seems like a finite reason compared to, like, you had an actor that a lot, a lot of people like. Now, listen, I believe in James Gunn, and I believe that the answer to that question will become clear. I I, I do believe that. But I have to say, as a butthurt, whiny little James Ca- or a Henry Cavill fan, um, I, it, it does raise a little bit of a question for me. It's like, so how come I don't get Henry as Superman anymore if we can still have all this? Because I was okay with it. Since you were, since we thought you might be resetting everything, but if you're not resetting anything, where the hell is Henry? But again, I'm sure the answers to that will come in Russia. In Russia, getting ready to well, do well, no, but, but I, I say that, but not. I'm not trying to be totally facetious. When the universe is reset, you know, you say that the the currents and eddies of time and space change, and the multiverse still exists. They're just probably not going to lean into it. So in the case, whatever happens at the end of Flashpoint, you could say that whatever universe they reboot, the Suicide Squad exists pretty much as it did because you've even got something, the first Suicide Squad movie and the second Suicide Squad movie kind of were a good indicator. Some of them were there for this first Suicide Squad movie, but now instead of it's Idris Elba is there, but we don't have Will Smith there. So you can just say that the shift in universes changed things but a lot of them say the same. Yeah, it does. Whenever you do something like this, you can say, like when you say everything changes as a result of this. Okay, but you came back into the world. Like we've seen some movies and shows and there are still cars. That that didn't change. Right. So they're probably going to say something's changed, something stay the same. But it's just that I, I'm now having to reconsider my position of being okay that Henry's not back with now I'm a little bit not okay with it. But again, I, I trust in James Gunn. We'll see yeah. where he goes. Let's focus back in on Waller here for a second. This is an interesting thing because they point out that Waller is kind of like the self-appointed shepherd, if you will, of the whole metahuman thing in the world. I thought the way they used her, like Black Adam wasn't great, but one of the really cool things about the post credit scene in Black Adam wasn't just the glory of Henry Cavill coming into Superman, but was Amanda Waller basically like, listen, dude, I'm Amanda Waller. I can easily just call in some favors from a lot of people who aren't even from this world. And there's something very cool about the character. I loved Peacemaker, so bringing some of Team Peacemaker in there is interesting. I don't know. What do you think about them moving forward with Waller? Well, I think it's, first of all, Viola Davis can do no wrong. Mm-hmm. And to have Viola Davis, at a again, she's at a fulcrum point. She's a, she's a person that probably is the same in many universes. So when the universe shifts at the end of Flash, she's still there. And, and I think, you know, she's ferocious. And Amanda Waller doesn't put up with any shit from anybody. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she's got her and fingers. she's not intimidated by anybody. No, and she's got her fingers in a lot of pies. I think what's really interesting about and I always loved Amanda Waller. I think that the first time she was introduced in the original Suicide Squad. And I've always loved her. And I think, you know, you keep her around because she's not a character. Like, no one's going to sit there and go, well, that's not, which universe is she from? She's the same in all universes. So it it makes sense to me that you have her, uh, I mean, linked to this. I mean, look at that. Come on, who doesn't doesn't love her? I love her. (laughs) Um, And she's great in this role. And what's interesting is maybe she remembers all the different universes. Well, she's not a metahuman, though. No, but... But whatever happened at the end of Flashpoint, so you think they could her... have maybe a character that's a little bit like Bishop in X Men: Days of Future Past, that actually a, char- a central character that actually has and retains the memories of the other universes. Why not? Yeah, they could do, do you go think that, that her daughter, Danielle, who's played by Danielle Brooks in Peacemaker, gets more involved in the overall story? When we see Amanda Waller, do you see her daughter coming more into that story? Well, he does say that Team Peacemaker is going to be there, right? So, I mean, if you're going to do a Waller series and you're bringing anybody from the Peacemaker series, that seems to be the most logical yeah, one to do. Yeah, you have to bring her daughter. Yeah. And, and she especially was great with her... in that show. Huh? She was great in that oh, show. Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, she was really great in uh, Orange is the New Black, and I was really excited to see Danielle Brooks show up in this as well. She's a classically trained actress, and um, and, and it, I love the fact that she does have that conflict. She's not as hardcore as her mom. She's not, uh, you yeah. know, Amanda Waller, like you said, she 
puts up with nothing and she's ruthless, whereas her daughter has more uh, you know, emotional conflict about that. So I think that in having the two of them have more interaction, because remember, we never saw them together in Peacemaker. It was only via FaceTime or Zoom or whatever. Yeah. I really like to see her daughter being brought into the story more. All right. That's Waller. Now let's get on to the next series they're talking about, which is going to get a lot of people excited, and that is the Green Lantern series people have been waiting for. It is now just called Lanterns, and they did a great compromise bringing the Green Lantern I think a lot of people wanted and the Green Lantern other people like myself really wanted. They're going to bring them together in what they are calling a true detective-like series, which is one of the most exciting things to hear this is what Variety wrote about this. Of all the TV series Saffron and Gunn seemed most excited for, Lanterns, which Saffron disguised as a huge HBO quality. I love that they're referencing the HBO quality stuff. Huge HBO quality event that is very much in the vein of True Detective. The show will focus on two of the best known members of the Green Lantern Corps. Hal Jordan, which to me is the definitive uh, Green Lantern, the test pilot first played on screen by Ryan Reynolds, which I'm sure he'd like to forget, and John Stewart, an ex-Marine and one of the DC's first black superheroes who investigate a mystery that Saffron says plays a really big role in leading us into the main story that we're telling across our film and television series. This is a very important show for us, Saffron continued. So, you know, a lot of the questions have been going into Green Lantern. Are we going to get, you know, the de facto Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. Are we going to get the more modern one that a lot of the younger audiences know, John Stewart? Are we going to get a Kyle Rayner? Are we going to get a Guy Gardner? Are we going to get a, I don't know, any of the other ones? And it looks like they're going to go with this to the idea of an HBO series of Green Lanterns, but in a true detective kind of mystery kind of thing. I am salivating. I am salivating about this. I, I love the sound of this. Rob, what do you think? Dude. I love this idea so much because you've got you basically it's lethal weapon in space, even though it's on Earth. It's good. Yeah. By the way, and it's, that's they do make. I should have pointed that out. They do make clear that this is going to be a terrestrial based series. It is going to be based on. Earth. So here you've got two guys. This is how I see them doing this. You've got two guys, both military. You know, they 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 can finish each other's sentences. They're the best of the best. They're a team, but they're also lanterns. And, and they are working together, true detective style. Maybe maybe they're at odds. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're, that's why they're paired. Uh, this sector of the universe needs two lanterns. And whatever's going on, uh, clearly they have an overarching mythology. Something is coming. But to see these two guys working together, I mean, it reminds me of, of Green Arrow, the Green Arrow and Green Lantern comics of the 70s when Oliver Queen and Hal Jordan teamed up. My ward, Speedy, is a junkie discovering the heart of america this really excites me a lot and the fact that because they're gonna this is gonna be your gateway into the cosmic and the authority is gonna have certain because they go through the bleed and stuff i just love what they're doing with this it sounds really interesting to me um and when they mentioned true detective come on oh first yeah. season of true detective <laughs> but done because because true detective had a, the first season had a lot of supernatural overtones and things I mean, I can, I, I, it's gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna touch on all of the different parts of this DC universe thing. And they're gonna get involved probably with Swamp Thing, with Supergirl, with Superman, with Bat, all that stuff and space. So, yay. I also love the fact they're saying that this mystery is gonna be, again, like he said to mention, a lot of the projects in this first phase are things about uncovering the overall story. And, yeah. and apparently this true detective thing is going to be one of those. And I'll well. bet you they, I don't know how the structure is going to be, but isn't it going to be, you're you're going to see probably flashbacks about how they became lanterns, maybe uh, all kinds of stuff. I can't wait for this. A hardcore true detective S green lantern series. Sign me up. All right. And I'll tell you what, as excited as I am for it, it's not my most excited project they've got. We'll get to that one in just a second. Next one, let's go on to this. It's a character a lot of people have been asking for for a while. They would have liked to have seen him maybe teamed up with a Ted Cord Blue Beetle. That part's not happening. But Booster Gold is oh, coming yeah. as an HBO series. Uh, finally, there's Booster Gold, which allows the DCU to fully stretch into original, co into outright comedy. While he may not be, while may, while he may not be familiar to casual fans of DC, the character, also known as Mike Carter, 
is a fan favorite among devoted readers. Saffron called Booster Gold a loser from the future who <laughs> uses basic technology to come back to today and pretend to be a superhero. Um, <laughs> this is a character, and again, a long for a long time, a lot of people would have loved to have seen a Blue Beetle, Booster Gold, Buddy Cop kind of thing. We're not going to get that. But this shows that DC is looking at really oh mixing up and diversifying the type of stories they're going to tell. We've got everything from Superman <sighs> Legacy, a harder edge Supergirl. We got straight up horror with Swamp Thing and now something that kind of gives them a straight up comedy kind of avenue here with Booster Gold. Rob, I, I know you were one of those people that was looking forward to Booster Gold in a team up with a Ted Cord. <sighs> Blue Beetle, but what do you think about a standalone Booster Gold HBO series? Well, before he teamed, I I loved the Booster Gold comic series. As a matter of fact, now I'm going to go get my Booster Gold number one that's in mint condition slapped. By the way, is it a hot toy? <laughs> there is no hot toy oh, Booster too Gold. Okay. I'm going to get it slapped because it just went up in value. But I love Booster Gold and his robot skeets from the future. Um, I, I love this comic. I love Booster Gold. And I'm telling you, people asked about if there's ever going to be a character that Chris Pratt could be, I know it might be a little cliche because of Star Lord, like you were saying Some earlier. Some similarities. You're to not Star wrong Lord, with yeah. that. You're not wrong with that. But that to me is perfect casting. It's uh, perfect casting. What do you think? You. I'm sorry. I I this is the first time I've ever seen this character, and immediately I thought Mark Paul Gossler. I'm just saying. I think Zach Morris. Yeah. You know, wasn't for, he in True Detective season two or something? Mark Paul Gossler, no. No, I'm just saying he, you know, he was great in Franklin and Bash. He has the comedic chops. He really does. He's at an age where to play, you know, a former football star come back. I, I don't know why. But I he's just... still a TV star. But this is HBO. So, this is oh, TV. Oh, okay. All right. oh, hi, yeah, 1986 call. Anymore. They want their Golden Globe. What are you talking about? He's a TV star. This by the way, what, what that's show actually he not did? bad cast. I think show Mark Paul Gossler would be a great choice for this. How old is he? He's like in his mid forties. Oh, but here, yeah. no, here's a question: What was the show? He had a show recently. Yeah, that's I thought that lasted one season, where he it was kind of like Last of Us, where like he had the, there was a little girl that had that's the wrong picture to use as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but I mean, there where he had he had to take. Care yeah, of this little girl yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a special gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the yeah, show, yeah. guys in the live chat, if you guys can remember it, it was yeah, I think it was a vampire show. He's doing Will Trent right now. Oh, was it the was it it was Passage? Was that yeah, the yeah, Passage? It was passage yeah. based on the uh, Cronin books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so I mean, and I thought, well, he was actually really good in that. He might be a little old for the role at this the point. The thing about Booster Gold is it's a perfect opportunity for an actor in their late twenties. Oh, okay. You know, because I th I think a younger because that would be the kind of thing that, you know, a young kid steals technology and comes back to Earth. And then what happens with Booster Gold is he ends up becoming a superhero that gets sponsorships. Ah, oh, like, got it. Booster okay. Gold sponsored by blah, blah, blah. You know? a li there's a little Captain Amazing in there from Mystery Men. Totally. With, with Booster Gold. Um, so it'll be interesting. So Booster Gold is coming. Now that leads us to what is honestly, as far as the HBO side of things go, my most excite to me the one of the most exciting things we've heard the lanterns is huge like a lot of the stuff that we're hearing but for me this is the one that has the most potential paradise lost a story about themiscara long before wonder woman was born in a game of thrones style political intrigue thing uh, on the island. This Game of Thrones-ish story, Saffron said, is set on the island of Themyscira before the birth of Diana, a.k.a. Wonder Woman. It's really about the political intrigue behind a society, society of all women, Saffron said. Added gun, how did that come about? What's the origin of an island of all women? Why are the beautiful truths and the ugly truths behind all of that? And what's the scheming like between the different power players in that society? I will tell you what, I read that Mm -hmm. And look, what I I really like the uh, the first Wonder Woman movie, but one of my favorite parts about it, besides Chris Pine, was the whole, the Isle of Themyscira and and the, the mythology they set up there. You do an HBO Game of Thrones style thing on an island filled with warrior women. 
I mean, the, 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 the roof of this, there is no roof to this. Th this thing is limitless in what the potential could be and how good this could actually be. Now, it's all going to come down to who's the showrunner they attach to it and all that kind of stuff. But this, to me, sounds unbelievable. Rob, well, what read think? what they go on uh, on that thing. If you go down, just scroll down. What was up before? Yeah, the, the, the provocative title recalls the Paradise Island Lost comic series authored by Phil Jimenez and George Perez which followed a civil war on Themyscira. However, that directly involved Wonder Woman. Now, here's the thing. I love George Perez's run on Wonder Woman. He took over after the crisis on Infinite Earths, and he was he was heavily involved with the gods and Ares, and I love this idea. I think this idea can be great, and if you're delving into the history, maybe they Wonder Woman could, you know, flashbacks. I don't know how they're going to do it, but this island tied into the gods, gods and monsters, you know, direct tie-ins to the pantheon of Greek or Roman gods, however you're going to go with that. I think this could be great. And because it's on HBO, there's upsides to it that pointed about 45 degrees. Just saying, for me as a man. Uh, well, for me as a woman, I would love to see this show. And I would love for them also to bring on Ashley Lyle, who is the creator of Yellow Jackets. Because when we talk about the way that uh, the dynamic between a society of only women work with one another. If you're not what, if you have not seen the first season of yellow jackets, it is phenomenal. And uh, I, I think that this could be really, really exciting. Well, and I would love to see this. I mean, what's really interesting is delving into a matriarchal, all kidding aside, delving into a matriarchal society is the perfect way to, you know, how everyone's talking about, all the different kinds of politics that we're dealing with today. Here is a society that is all women. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What does that political structure look like? Uh, you, you know, when you have a Congress or some kind of governmental structure that's run by women, how would they do that? They touched so, on that a little bit in Why yeah, the Last Man. Abs absolutely. Yeah. And and but this and this, I I would be fascinated. I hope they're they're going to need to get great writers for the show yeah. and great actors. But I think that this show, you know, it's interesting because. When you want to do something allegorical or deal with modern politics and doing it in the framework of a science fiction fantasy or, tele or horror television show, you can delve into issues and people don't go, this show is so woke or whatever. Mm -hmm. They could really do it in this and make this fascinating and make it really cool. I was recently, I just completed, I just recently wrapped a film where the almost the entire crew was women. You're right. Right writer, director, uh, DP, um, like, and, and it was an incredible experience uh, for a number of reasons. But one of the things I walked up to one of the producers, a woman and the first AD, also a woman, and I said, you know, the big difference between this and every other set, in addition to just being a lovely experience, and they went, what? And I said, usually around this time of the day, it really stinks. <laughs> And, you know, so that's just a little, well, that it smelled was really nice. Like usually when it's, <laughs> well, a, let me ask you this, inclines, let me ask you this little lady, was it the... all dude cat crew. I'm telling you anybody that's shot with a mostly male crew, when you have a small space and it's the end of the day, the room stinks. Okay. All women didn't Was think. the grip and electric you... department, mostly women, women, grips and electric, mostly women, a couple dudes, all mostly right. women. Just I was really impressed. I was really impressed. Yeah. I've worked on a couple projects that are all women and you're right, Rob. It is a very different, not better, not worse, just very different, different political and social structure. So I would be really excited to see how that manifests, you know, in this world. But again, James, Call Ashley Lyle, bring her on board. She's doing yellow jackets, but she'll find the time in her schedule. I don't know her. I have no skin in the game. I'm just saying she's brilliant. She gets this world. Bring her on board. It's going to be cool, though. All right. With that down, guys, that's your rundown. So we run through all this again. We start with the motion pictures. We are getting, uh, where do we go here? Yes. We start on the thing with the movies. Let's bring up my screen. We've got Superman Legacy. Coming out, feature film, probably going to be directed by James Gunn. That's where they're, uh, that's where they're hinting. The Authority, uh, we've got Brave and the Bold is going to bring Damian Wayne into it and the Bat Family and introduce us to our new DCU Batman. Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, and Swamp Thing. On the HBO television side, we've got Creature Commandos. We've got Waller. 
We've got Lanterns, which sounds absolutely incredible to me. We've got Paradise Lost, which I think is the one that has the most potential. And then we've got Booster Gold. Guys, that is the lineup. It is an impressive, aggressive lineup. They're saying that their target right now is to have two movies and two series every year. But James Gunn says, listen, but we're not going to film something that's not ready to go. He was very, very strict about that. We are not going to be people holding to dates. If a movie's not ready to go, if a show's not ready to go, we don't start shooting it until it does. But their aim, their goal is every year, two feature films, two series, and uh, we're going to see if they can stick to that. What's really interesting is if you look at the heavy hitters as far as the Justice League is concerned. So they're dealing with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, in a way, with Paradise Island, Green Lantern. You've got Supergirl that could be a stand-in for other characters. Swamp Thing, which could lead to other people like Phantom Stranger. They've really set the table, and I do think the authority is going to wind up being the villains of this first Gods and Monsters phase in some way, shape, or form. I look forward to Superman and Apollo fighting. What do you think the Lanterns did? Do you think the Lanterns digs up that the authority is actually committing a bunch of crimes? Or? Well, that you know, the, the authority's got interdimensional travel and the bleed or however they're going to do that. I think something like that. I mean, there, there's what it's, it's stuff they haven't said, you know, but but I do like the fact that the authority touches on a lot of different things that they can use because the authority was, like they said, it was the, it started out as Wildstorm characters that was folded into DC. So they're not so beholden with the wider DC mythology of the past. Well, I don't think James Gunn will be really beholden to the mythology anyway, but here's a question. One thing... Well, there was a number of things. I meant the past really, of the comics. Right, yeah. One thing that was noticeably absent. Just a couple of weeks ago, Jason Momoa got on social media coming out of a meeting with James Gunn and Peter Safran, hooting and hollering and screaming and yelling about how excited he was, blah, blah, blah. I really thought, I'll be honest with you, I thought since they let him put that video out that we would hear something whether it was Lobo related, some other character related, Aquaman related, I really thought that since they let him put that video out, that we would get something about the future of Jason Momoa here, and we didn't. So I thought I found that interesting. I think we're not going to hear anything about what that was all about because they've got they've got a year from now almost Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. They don't want anything to overshadow that movie. Not right now. All right, guys. The question is for you. What do you think about the big announcements that come out? Again, this is just the first piece of it. Uh, much, much, much more to come. But we're starting to get a picture of the roadmap. I think there's a, several things here that are really, really interesting. A couple of things make me scratch my head a little bit and wondering how are they going to approach that. But like I said, I've got a lot of trust in James Gunn. Let's see how he navigates it. Which of these things are you most excited about? Maybe which of the things are the projects you're least excited about? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, it is now time for us to open up the Super Chats and hear from you to hear your thoughts, theories, and opinions, questions you have about this announcement. I mean, let's say that's probably what you want to talk about is this announcement. Oh, what do you guys have in there? Go ahead and jump into the Super Chats and fire those in. We'll address those once we take a moment here to thank a couple more of the sponsors of our video here today. First off, our great friends, you need to get them and go start learning a bunch of stuff about following your dreams over at Masterclass. And of course, my mobile service provider, the good folks at Mint Mobile. We want to thank a sponsor of this video, Masterclass. Masterclass offers classes on a wide variety of topics, all taught by world-class instructors at the very top of their fields. Each class is broken out into individual video lessons, usually around 10 minutes long. And Masterclass is completely accessible on your phone, the web, smart TV, and available via audio mode to listen to classes on the go. They have over 2,500 video lessons from over 180 of today's most brilliant minds. They're all available anytime, anywhere on iOS, Android, desktop, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. Now, obviously around here on the John Campus Show, we love our movies. So why not learn filmmaking from Jodie Foster or maybe directing from Ron Howard himself or the great Neil Gaiman doing his masterclass on the art of storytelling. And you guys have heard me talk about my 
favorite masterclass, Business Strategy and Leadership by Big Papa Iger himself, Bob Iger, the new and returning CEO of Disney. So guys, I highly recommend that you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a John Campia Show listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Just go to masterclass.com slash Campia now. That's masterclass.com slash Campia for 15% off Masterclass. Guys, we want to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2023, why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for your phone bill? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save money this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. Guys, I have told you before that when I was on one of the major phone carriers, I was spending literally three times as much every month and switching to Mint Mobile couldn't have been easier. So for people just looking to save some extra money this year, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and switch easily in just minutes with eSIM. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. All right, and thank you to our friends at Masterclass and, of course, Mint Mobile for being sponsors of today's episode of the John Campia Show. All right, guys, let's get over and hear what you guys have to say about all this as we jump into our Super Chats. Aaron, what do we got? This one is a Super Chat from Trevor, who sends in a $20 Super Chat. Thank Thanks, you, Trevor. Trevor. Uh, Trevor says, with some support, screw, screw Universal Pictures, fight the good fight, hashtag Team Campia. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly let you guys know what's going on. So... Um, as, as many YouTube content creators happens, I got a content claim, uh, from universal pictures on a 16 year old, uh, movie review. I did on the, ironically enough, James Gunn film slither. Uh, they were put a copyright claim against it because I used a couple of clips from the trailer of slither in my movie review. Now it needs to be pointed out that within the uh, description by YouTube about what is appropriate use for using clips and stuff like that. What is proper fair use? Basically that that's the question. Um, I'm going to bring this up here on my screen. If you've got access to that, uh, you're going to have to refresh it. So YouTube's own statement on the proper application of fair use includes examples Include showing short clips of a film while reviewing that movie. You can take it down now. Um, so I did what's called filing a dispute, which is what everybody does. And when I've had content claims made against my channel in the past, 99.999999% of the time, I file the dispute and then they let go of the content claim. Because that then somebody actually physically looks at it and goes, oh, the algorithm caught it, but hey, yeah, this is perfectly fine. They let it go. Happens all the time. No big deal. So I submitted the dispute. Only this time, some ignorant jackalope over at Universal said, nope, we reject the dispute. Despite the fact that my 16-year-old video is perfectly within the appropriate boundaries the appropriate everything about i've done i did in that video 16 years ago is perfectly appropriate and they made the decision to reject the dispute the, the dispute so that makes things a little bit more serious because then i had the choice of either rub some vaseline on my pucker hole bend over and let universal give it to me up the ass or yeah. i could file what's <laughs> called Sorry. An appeal. Now, the danger with filing an appeal, which is the next level up from the dispute, is that if your appeal gets rejected, your channel can end up with a content strike or a copyright strike. And if you get a copyright strike, you can't upload videos, you can't live stream, and you can't have ads. You don't. You can't generate revenue. 
which basically it's not hyperbole says eh, that that could very well shut my channel down because almost everything we do is live video. Um, but I am a scorched earth. I, I was telling somebody this morning, I am a scorched earth kind of guy. If you, if you wrong me, I will happily drive my car off the cliff. If it means I get to hit you on the way down. That's, that's just me. A little bit of Italian in me, if you will. It's an Italian part of my nature. Um, so I have filed the appeal. I made the decision to file the appeal uh, because I'm not just going to let Universal get away with this. And what I'm hoping is cooler heads will prevail, that Universal will look at this and goes, oh my gosh, yeah, of course this is a perfectly appropriate thing, and they'll let it go. If not, it could get into legal issues and stuff like that. We'll we'll see where things go. But yeah, that's uh, that's what that thing uh, is talking about. So, By the way, he sent us a $20 super chat yeah then they go towards the legal fund uh whatever so so we'll see but again i i am choosing not to get uh, again some freaking ignorant moron who's probably an intern who's sitting at a chair jerking off while looking at old magazines uh decided nah and hit uh, reject the dispute I, I i'm not holding this against universal as a whole yet We'll see what happens after the appeal process. I, I'm going to assume this is going to get into the hands of somebody intelligent over there, and this will all be settled and we get to all move on, uh, but uh, but we'll see. What's right. a magazine? <laughs> yeah, what's a magazine? All right, what's next? Uh, some more support. Uh, a. Marcellus sends in a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, A. Marcellus, and says they can definitely do a mid-30s Batman for Brave and the Bold. You can say that a 20-year-old Bruce Wayne hooked up with Talia during his training, and then when he's 35, he meets 15-year-old Damien. Yeah, you can. Of course, then you run into the problem of um, a, a little bit of an issue called Dick Grayson. How many years did he spend with Dick Grayson? Because Dick Grayson happens well after. Because, you know, how old should he have been to take on an adoptive son award, if you will? And then how many years is Dick Grayson with him? And then after that, Jason Todd. And then after that, Tim Drake. Um, so If they do all that. If they do all that, which I think they will. Listen, they can absolutely come up with ways to say he's mid-30s. I like what Rob's saying, though early 40s a little bit that seems to make more sense and gives a little bit more room for that but who knows listen a lot of things we still need to find out but you're not wrong all right what's the next this is from Dumbrodor says will the supergirl movie have superman in it if he's in it then gun must get the writers and showrunners of the supergirl tv show to do the movie <laughs> lol jk yeah uh, that's triggering some ptsd uh yeah no but listen i fully expect gun did say by the way that you're gonna see these like then when they talked about um uh what what's not the commandos the other one the the uh the one you're excited about the we just talked the lanterns about, no the the group the authority. Oh, the authority the authority the james gunn specifically said you're going to see them interacting with the main characters so I think we're going to see a lot of crossover. I think you're going to see a lot of these characters popping up in each other. Well, the projects. authority is essentially the Justice League without a world that has the Justice League in it. Mm. I would imagine that the conflict that the Justice League is going to probably by force have to take over that mantle. And that's where I see the conflict happening. That's why I'm really excited. All right. What's next? This is from Stubble McShave who says... Just wanted to support you. Love you guys. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate that very much. Al Renshaw says Gunn and Zaslav will be walking into stage and onto the stage of Comic Con like Justin Hammer dancing onto the stage <laughs> in Iron Man Two. Money, money. Of course, that it's all going to depend too on. I don't think we've heard an official word. Have they put DC fandom to bed? Because the last one was a disaster. The first one was great. The first one was surprisingly good. Second one was a complete disaster. Um, and I often, I wonder if DC fandom was really just something to use during the pandemic era, but now they want to get back to live on stage. I, I hope they go big at Comic-Con. Oh, I, I really, really do. I think they're going to go big and they're going to have, I mean, if they want to get this stuff out by 2025, they've got to get started. Oh yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully you're right. Hopefully they do that. All right. What's next? Uh, this is from Sam Fisher, who says the most exciting projects for me is the Batman movie with an already established Bat family and Damien and um, uh, with an already established Bat family and Damien. And after Werewolf by Night, Swamp Thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what they're going to do with the Bat family is going to be interesting. So they're going to say they're clearly saying this is a very, very well established Batman with a well established extended family. Um, the, the Swamp Thing is very interesting. 
I mean, what they can do with that going into the route of horror. I think Rob brought up some really good points about James Wan. I mean, I don't think they're going to get James Wan to do it. I think he's going to be a little bit busy with his new partnership with uh, Blumhouse. But what a choice that would be. So uh, we'll see. All right, what's next? Uh, Al Renshaw sends in some more support and says, what's the crew's thoughts on the Super Mario Brothers TV spot? I like the cat costume, and I think Rogan's DK voice is great. Hashtag cats are awesome. Yeah, cats are a verm verminous Cats are uh, awesome. I will uh, just talk over John for whatever yeah, he's no, got just to say. Uh, he's infestation a monster. Don't listen to him. In your house. Don't listen house. to him talking about cats. So it's all right. I mean, the trailers have been great. Um and that that spot fits in well with the scene they've already shown us in the movie, so that that's great. I mean, there's nothing groundbreaking there, but I'm very very excited about the movie, though. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, and he, by the way, re replace your cats with rats or something. You you'll be happier. Cats are the right. greatest animals. What's next? Rats are great too. They're very intelligent. It's actually true. They can sniff out. Um, so are pigs. Do you have them in your house? I want some. I would. I would love. It. I know you can't talk to me. And Jonathan, Anne would they're... actually love to have a baby pig. Anne would they're love great. to have like a pig. I don't smart. know why, but yeah. I want to hear they're more loyal than dogs. Pigs are. Yeah. Yeah. It's the reason why I stopped eating bacon. Can't do it. All right. What's Seconds next? from disaster says DC has an awesome slate. Over under thirty percent. We get Brainiac in the Supergirl movie. Isn't he a big part of her history? It all depends on which history you're talking yeah. about. That's the thing with these comic books. But if she's if they're gonna play into the horrible you know upbringing she had i could see brainiac coming out of that somehow did you read this 2021 run they're talking about with no. her growing so, so yeah yeah so i'm not familiar if they if they had brainiac as a part of that particular story run tom king he's hit and miss for me but i i would definitely read that brainiac seems what's going on over he there just choked on something no, nothing, nothing. brainiac seems to be getting ahead of yourself a little bit for this yeah. early, early, early stage. I'm going to go low chance, but definitely possible. All right, what's next? Uh, Amon sends in some super chat and says, the new Ant-Man spot dropped exactly at 9 uh, Pacific time, LOL. Oh, did it? Because I remember I got on Twitter today just as oh. a joke to said, what do you think the chances are that Marvel drops either a new Ant-Man, Guardians, or um, what's the other one they got coming out? Ant-Man or the Marvels trailer to coincide with this if they actually try, but a tv spot doesn't count that one doesn't count all right what's next josh becker says i hope gun introduces teen titans at some point i some point anything can happen at some point i don't think don't expect to see teen titans introduced anytime in the next five years so i don't think all right what's next um, from Sam Fisher again, who says, I know Feige isn't reactionary, but if the authority works, I really hope that means that we get a Squadron <laughs> Supreme movie. Maybe. I mean, that's their Justice League. So, I mean, somebody said we're getting Hyperion. Yeah, listen, listen whatever does or does not come, it's going to be as a result of what Kevin Feige planned. Kevin Feige, he always leads the dance. He never reacts to what other people do in their universes. He's always got his own plans. So, Listen, that's always, that's been something that's been talked about before, so it could very well happen, but it won't have anything to do with the authority. That much we can guarantee. All right, what's next? Uh, Tevin Como sends in a $10 super chat and says, Last week, John and Robert got into a debate about the Oscars. It was very entertaining. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like first take or undisputed, but with movies instead of sports. LOL, new segment coming. Yeah, no. Um, and, and unfortunately, like, I, I remember I cut it short because it just got to the point where Rob and I were just repeating the same thing over and over again. So we eventually had to pull the plug on that. Um, but listen, that's the thing about movies and movie news and TV and streaming. Like the, because art is so subjective and are, the way people like it's surrounded by human beings, which are unpredictable and, and palatable and all that kind of stuff all the time. We're often going to have all of us as fans are going to have different opinions. And that's when we get into it sometimes. All right. What's next? James Argenta sends in a $10 super chat and is a friend of the family. Thanks, James. Uh, Son of Batman was an animated film that adapted the Damien story. The film kicked off with Slade's killing Roz, with Slade killing Roz. My favorite scene was Dick beats Damien in a fight and calling Bruce to pick up his son. I never did watch it because I find most of Marvel and DC's animated stuff to be garbage. But I, well, so I, I read that, co that comic book run, which is similar, and the Grant Morrison stuff. It's great. I mean, I, 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 that's what I believe that's what that film is based on, but I highly recommend reading that run because it's a really great run and it's collected in hardcover form. All right. What's next? Uh, Jay sends in a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, Jay. If you had to pick one from the three below, which do you think is the most essential part of making a successful movie? 
Yeah, we don't have, yeah, it's the director. The screenwriters, the director, or the actors. Yeah, it's, listen, all three are important. Um, but at the end of the day, as much as a, a good screenplay is absolutely essential, good performers are absolutely essential, the woman or man sitting in the director's chair is ultimately the conduit of all of it and makes the determination about, you know, yeah, you can write something in the script. The director can totally, totally go in a different direction. The director can take something that a character says, change it. Maybe a character says it one way, but changing the way it's said totally changes the nature of a scene, whatever everything. Look, it's all important. The producers are important. The writers are important. The financiers are important. All the costume designers, the makeup artists, the visual effects artists, the DP, like everybody's super, super important. It's the director. The director is the absolute most important person involved. Talking about a movie with a television show, that becomes the showrunner. Mm -hmm. But in, in in the movie's director, Rob, you've worked on all angles of these things. But How I, would you answer? I think your answer was correct. I mean, there are all those people are essential. The thing about the director is that it's the role of a director to take all these disparate elements and employ them, use them in the way they should be used to create the best film possible. But then again, you can't make a film without actors. You can't make a film without a script. You can't make a film without the grip and electric department. The problem is every one of those departments looks to the director to tell them, what are we doing? The and worst thing you can have on a set, the way to lose your crew, the worst mm -hmm. thing on a movie set is when your director does not know what the next shot is. Oh, yeah. That is the worst thing. Because then everybody loses. You're like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing or this girl doesn't know what he's doing. And I'll tell you something. A director has until lunch the first day to win your crew. Yep. The producer wins the crew at lunch because lunch better be damn good. Mm -hmm. But the, the director, as you know, you got ha you got barely half a day, if that. Basically, you got an hour. The first rehearsal. But you know, you're you're absolutely right. As an actor, I will say that the director 100% is the most important. And everybody's saying, you know, in the chat, like, oh, the screenwriter, the screenwriter. I have seen very good, we've all seen very good scripts destroyed by directors who do not know how to how to translate it to the screen and we've also seen directors who have taken a mediocre script and, and given it a it. vision and elevated it to something that wasn't on the page you know and and a, and a good director knows how to take the talent of an actor and really let it shine and also knows how to get an actor out of their goddamn trailer and by the way if you have a great script and would like to, to get exposure <laughs> don't do it <laughs> Don't Let's forget to send Robert Meyer for <laughs> your scripts. By the way, wants to see them. If I love to recommend a movie that if you haven't seen this movie, it stars Robert De Niro, and it is one of the truest uh, portrayals of the movie, movie business from a pr producer standpoint. It's the called, dog? No, it's called What Just Happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was directed by Barry Levinson. That movie, talk about getting an actor out of a trailer. There's a scene with Bruce Willis who plays himself. What Just Happened, Barry Levinson directed it. Not a lot of people know it. It's a low-budget film. Watch it. All right. Let's keep moving here. What's next? Uh, Raymond Ver Verata sends in a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, Raymond. Oh, yeah. Rest in peace, Cindy Williams of Laverne and Shirley. She also came out in George Lucas's American Graffiti along with Ron Howard and Harrison Ford. There's an online video of her auditioning for Princess Leia. Um, Cindy Williams. Laverne and Shirley. It was a little before my time, but I used to watch reruns. Sometimes when I would come home, because it was a show like Happy Days and whatever that had so, a long run. It was, it was a spinoff. It was a part of a shared cinematic universe. Uh, Laverne and Shirley was. And, With Mork and Mindy. And of course, uh, her counterpart in that just went on to direct big. Penny Marshall. <laughs> Penny, Penny Marshall. Marshall, who was like one of the more celebrated directors, award-winning director. Um, Laverne and Shirley was delightful it really was that was a delightful show I, I i watched a lot of that as a like i said a teenager when i would come home or lunches i'd watch flintstones and i would watch you know laverne and shirley or happy or one of the other like rerun shows um very sad to hear about that and you're right she very easily could have really taken off um after laverne and shirley don't know why that didn't really work out but for whatever reason she was terrific give us any chance we'll take it give us any, any rule, rule we'll break, break it, it. <laughs> all right what's gonna, next gonna make our uh dumbledore sends in some more support and says who cares about guns d slee slate a new gotham knights tv spot Heck just yes. got released that's the real dc news right there i noticed john there was Heck no yes. mention of that as part of the yeah DC gun didn't slate. seem to have anything yeah, to say about that. that if there was ever something that was destined for one and done i think it's probably this gotham but listen we have not seen it. We've seen terrible, terrible, truly terrible promos for it. 
But we've all seen bad trailers to good movies, bad bad commercials for good shows. Could be genius, John. Maybe it'll be brilliant. Well, be. I don't know. Let's not judge. All Hope right, let's next. eternal. Uh, Josh Kahn sends in a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, Josh, the support. Takeaway from friends online and work. A very casual movie audience member was the DC was that the DC announcement flopped for them. Too many projects announced and reminds them why Marvel's been a turnoff lately. Here, well, here's the thing. Hmm. The average film goer is, the, the, this press release was not for the average film goer. No. The average film goer isn't even going to hear about this announcement. Mm -hmm. The average film goer is not going to variety.com to look up what they're saying about this. So, yeah, I can get it. If an average film goer kind of stumbled across this, they're looking at it and go, okay, eh. but that's fine because that's not who this was for. This was for those of us who are on, like those of you who watch shows like this, those of us who make shows like this, this was for us. And we have the kind of background, people who watch shows like this, people like this, we all have the background in this stuff to really get excited about it. So yeah, it wasn't for the average movie. The average film goer is going to start to get or not get excited once trailers start coming out and only at that point. So I don't think that's something they need to worry about. All right, what's next? Um, and says saying all films, shows, animation, and games will be connected sounds a lot like when Disney said that all Star Wars is canon, and we know how that went. I said that I've said that exact same thing many times. Yeah, like when Disney came out and bought Star Wars, they like, it's all going to be connected. It's all going to be canon. I'm like, ah, uh, good luck with that. And sure enough, within a couple of years, you started to see it crack, and now it's canon shmanon again. Um, yeah, I I think it's a little bit too ambitious. Look again, they did give themselves an out though. James Gunn saying, hey, everything's connected and anything that's not is under DC Elseworlds. So they've kind of got a built in out for that, right? Unlike what Star Wars did when they try to do. So that's the one little difference. All right, what's next? From Dominic Summer says, new goal, just survive until 2025. <laughs> Kang Dynasty, Fantastic Four, the Batman 2, and the new Superman all within less than a calendar year. It's going to be a good year. It's a good year. <laughs> and for those of us who are, you know, I say things like uh, inside to keep our nose to the, uh, for us nerds, um, that's, that's, that's going to be a real good year. <laughs> I'm very, very excited about that year. All right, what's next? From Dominic Summer, who said, wait, no, I just read that. Thank you. Oh, bumped down. That's there okay. You Uncle Bobby B says, really excited to see Knock at the Cabin tonight. If you were in the same position, would you save humanity or save your family? Well, again, one of, I haven't read the book. I haven't seen the movie. Uh, we understand the dilemma set up there. I, tonight, I didn't think I didn't think it opened until Thursday. Maybe there's a fan it, screen. Yeah. For, um, I saw M. Night Shyamalan say it's his best movie. Well, good, good for M. Night. <laughs> uh, but listen, it looks really good. It looks really good. I'm very excited about seeing it. Um, he had his look. If you if you had to sacrifice somebody you love incredibly dearly, but to save the world easily, I would save my family. Bye, world. Would you take but, your but own that, life? But that's the see. That's I would the take, no. I would take right? my own life and everybody with me. That I've already I've already told you guys my zombie apocalypse plan. Oh not yeah. Trying to be a hero, not trying to save the world. I die first, along with my family and Joey Bishop. The the, the with catch them. with that though is that if you don't sacrifice a member of your family, they're dead anyway because the world's going to end. So it's kind of like a little bit of a catch anyway. All right, what's next? Sam Fisher says Damien first becomes Robin because Dick couldn't look at Tim as his subordinate. He saw them as equals. So do you think that Batman could actually be Dick Grayson? No. No, they're 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 not. No, starting off a new page and a new phase of the, they're not. They're going to start off Batman as the person, the the individual, the entity that everybody on the planet sees as Batman, Bruce Wayne. They're yeah. not going to come out the gate with something different. That's going to leave ninety percent of the audience going, "What now?" No, they're. That's they're why with that. lanterns, they're they're. You've got Hal Jordan and John Stewart. It's and by the way, you already said Peter Safran already said this is a father and son story. So Damian Wayne. Yeah. Is Bruce a Wayne's son. Story. Yeah. Interesting theory, but yeah, they're going to stick with Bruce Wayne. All right, what's next? This comes to us from KC Mack. Out of everything that came out today, I'm really looking forward to seeing Lanterns and Swamp Thing the most. Tell you what, that okay, what's Swamp Thing can be just about anything. So that's really the fact that they're going horror. But the Lanterns, once they start making comparisons to True Detective, <sighs> I'm like, ooh, because not, listen, I understand. You, there's, there's a very easy 
thought process you could have of, ooh, Green Lanterns, big explosions in space and big giant fists punching other big monsters in the mouth. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that, and that's cool. A child can do that too. But take those characters with that kind of power and you tell a grounded kind of true detective story mm. with guys, oh. Dude, I'm telling you. It's the man. leaning into the like the noir aspect for me. Yes. That's what I really like. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, ah, oh, so excited. That sounds so exciting to me. All right, what's next? Ty, uh, T, excuse me, TJ Perry sends in a ten dollars super chat and says, "For any knuckle draggers who have a problem with Bill and Frank's relationship, I've got bad news for you about Ellie. It's not a gay love story. It's a love story." Well, I mean, here's the thing too. Anybody who has a problem with Bill and Frank's relationship clearly did not play the game because they completely, they reveal that Bill is gay in the game. I mean, so I, what did you think they were going to do again? Look, it, it, that is what I said in the open spoiler discussion yesterday. Episode three of the last of us was not a gay love story. It was a love story and love blossoming and hope finding root in a world that has gone to hell and what how that can change the world for two people and then maybe that love can spread out start to impact and have influence on other people as well anyway uh, yeah but yeah guys everybody bill was gay in the game so I mean, it is what it is all right what's next uh dumbrodor writes in again to say i thought the idea of jensen ackles being batman was ridiculous because of his age but now it's totally viable because of james gunn's vision i'll tell you what the one thing working against my man Jensen Ackles, so good in The Boys, so good in Supernatural. Someone's got to tell me, how tall is he? Now, I, I, I get it. Listen, the, the pure, like, Hugh, Wolverine ain't supposed to be six foot three. Yeah. I do see Batman as a little bit taller, but listen, if they announce Jensen Ackles as being the new Batman, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. I'm totally good with it. Not but my first choice, but I'd be totally good with it. Do we get a height on Jensen Ackles? Says six zero. He's six, six feet. I, maybe it's just because Jared Padalecki is like seven foot eight or something like that, <laughs> that he always looks shorter. But He's does six it really matter totally in the works. world of film? That's what Apple boxes are for. Yeah, I mean, hard to do that with Batman. But again, Wolverine's not supposed to be six foot three. So, I mean, it would totally be fine. I'd be totally good with it. I'd be totally good with it. All right, what's next? Uh, Al Renshaw sends over under 20%. The authority is rated R. <sighs> under. If you're if you're tying it in completely with everything else, I think it's going to be under. I, I think th I I have to go over only because even the first, if if Apollo and Midnight are, are who they are, it's going to be hard to make them PG. You can do you can do that PG. I mean, you, I just or, think or PG thirteen. I think though that that they, Warner Brothers is the one studio that I don't think would shy away from making these movies R rated because they've had success with R rated franchise pictures mm -hmm. like The Matrix. You know, those were R-rated films, and they made lots of money. So I think if they come out, and James Gunn's already done Suicide, he's very right, R-rated. Right, but what happened with Suicide Squad? As much as I think it's like the second best DCU right. movie, and and there was, of course, the fact that an HBO release at the same, there were a lot of asterisks, absolutely. But mm -hmm. David Zaslav sees that the last experiment they did with an R-rated comic book film was disastrous financially. Sure. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It's a good, I, Listen, I think Rob is right. It's definitely a possibility. I still think, though, there's going to be a standard bit of wisdom that goes, hey, you know what really worked? R in our films didn't. R on HBO did. So maybe... I mean, it's tough because Joker made a billion dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. Joker made... A, that's a good point. Joker made a billion. But is this supposed to be the joyous kind of thing that is that people are supposed to be able to get their whole families into the DCU now? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's I mean, that's it's going to be interesting. I would. I, I bet they had to make a decision. Already, they haven't said anything, but they're not necessarily making these movies for kids. All right, what's next? Suthia says, "I'm sure Gunn learned a lot from Feige about storytelling, connectivity, and encouraging directors and writers to be creative while keeping within the story." Well, don't forget that before he was summarily dismissed from Marvel for a short time, um, Kevin Feige had kind of promoted James Gunn up to be his right hand guy, who was going to be in charge of all the the universe stuff of the mcu anything not earthbound and related anything galactic it was going to be james gunn was kind of kind of his be his lieutenant to run all that so i'm sure they've learned a lot from each other 
and the two remain close. Listen, James Gunn said the very first person he called once they signed the deal and it was a done deal, James Gunn says the very first person he got on the phone with and called was Kevin Feige. And Kevin Feige said, I'm rooting for this is going to be great. And listen, everybody wants a thriving comic book movie industry because if DC starts making all their movies great, that's going to be good for Marvel because uh, mm -hmm. because people aren't going to get fatigued of bad comic book movies as quickly. If DC keeps cranking out, starts mm -hmm. cranking out really, really good, high quality stuff, it's going to be good for everybody. They're going to be cheering each other on. I do not think we're going to get a DC Marvel crossover as a lot of people speculate. But I think, uh, yeah, they're going to be in each other's corner. Also, Competition breeds creativity. Yeah. There's a real diversity in storytelling types amongst what they're doing. Batman leaning into the family story. Supergirl being a bad Supergirl. All, I just think that that's one of the exciting things about these announcements is we're not going to get a bunch of homogenized stories. They'll still cross over, but they're all going to have their very own identities, which I think is really cool. All right. We got to keep moving here. What's next? Raymond Verada. Oh, we've already done these. Yeah, we'll yeah. scroll up a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit. Well, we'll scroll back and one more, one more. There we are. Uh, Mike's Movie Madness says, Rob, bruh, capitalist Superman Red Sun, take my money now. I know, right? I'm, I'm, first of all, I've wanted to. I think a lot of people have wanted to see Red Sun done for a very, very long. Obviously, you can't do it in a shared cinematic universe. It could be an Elseworlds thing. Bring back Henry Cavill to do that. Plus, everybody would already get it. Yeah. You know, you've, it, 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 the idea that, because I always saw, you know. Because that Superman didn't land in Kansas. He landed in Soviet. Yeah, and, and to have Henry Cavill had already played Superman, you it's a shorthand. You don't have to establish somebody else and make you like them as Superman. Right. All right, what's next? Purple Funk says, "Hi, crew. I think Swamp Thing would be th would be the through line between all the universes. His consciousness will be able to perceive multiple yep. realities. Hundred percent. I don't know that they will. I mean, on a level that could be true, but I don't think DC will take a character like Swamp Thing and say, hey, every everybody needs to really focus in on Swamp Thing right. to understand what's going on. Yeah, like no. not. Yeah, I don't, like I don't think he's going to be like say the Nick Fury of the DCU. Not at all. But on a deeper level." Yeah, something like that could definitely be a part of it. All right, what's next? Curious Jort says, could Damien be Batman's first Robin in this DCU? I don't think they're going to do that. Because uh, then, then you have no avenue for Nightwing. So I think they're going to... I think we're going to get this Batman... Now, again, I don't know, but I think Tim Drake, Jason Todd, obviously Dick Grayson. I, I think, well, 100% Dick Grayson at least. I do think they're going to be part of that world. I think so. We'll find out. Maybe Jason's already dead, but again, that then Bat Family, you got to have Red Hood. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's so a lot of stuff there. It's all right, what's next? Cool. Johnny Weiner says DC news hype has nothing compared to the Golden Boots. <laughs> Everybody, take a look again. Going back, one of the most ridiculous thing in D. Or don't forget, uh, what was the quarterback's name? I'm free. Who had the hats? Oh, uh, 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 oh, yeah. What's Not, it? talking about Namath, right? Or anything no, like no, that. no. The guy who was the quarterback of the Carolina Panthers and then was quarterback of New England oh. Patriots after. Why am I freezing on his name? Cam Tom Newton. Brady. Cam Newton. <laughs> uh, Cam Newton and his damn stupid hats. Uh, all right, what's next? Were they golden? Stubble McShave says, is Lobo, if Lobo is in one of these movies slash series, which one? Green Lantern, but he's not going to be. Yeah, I know. They would have announced Lobo as a, I think, again... Lobo think, would have been a highlight of this I think thing, yeah. they're waiting because, look, right now, nobody... Aquaman 1 was a billion-dollar movie. They don't want to overshadow anything that's happening with Lost Kingdom because they probably think it's also a billion-dollar movie. So why would they tell you, here's what's coming next? What they want people to focus on is what he's got coming up, and that's still a year away, well, 11 months away. All right, what's next? Uh, King of Almorac says, I love how DC's genres are so diverse. We could get a war film with Enemy Ace, a Western with Jonah Hex, or High Fantasy with Shining Knight. Yep. Yeah, I don't expect to see them trying Jonah Hex again anytime soon. Yeah, no. Um, but no, that that's the great thing. They're already showing, look, that is something Marvel has actually done very well for a long time, is diversifying up the types of movies and the subgenres that their movies inhabit. And to see that DC is embracing that right, right out of the gate. Straight up comedy, straight up horror, uh, other sorts of things, everything in between. I think that's very encouraging for their future. All right, what's next? Big Mouth Stan sends in a $20 super chat. Thank, Thank you, you, Big so Mouth. Thank you so much, Stan. 
To me, the Booster Gold show is the only one that felt it was out of place. He's a super fan from the future of the main DCU cast. I feel they need to establish the main characters before they do this project. I disagree. I think you need to have main characters. I mean, Superman's going to be there. Batman is clearly going to be there. That's fine. And James Gunn talked and Peter Safran talked in their press thing about the fact that we need to have our main characters there so we can launch these other characters. Um, so no, I, I don't believe, you know me, I do not believe in formula that you got to have these ones here in order. No, you can look what happened with Peacemaker. Peacemaker became like the number one show in the world, right? You don't need to have the, all these other characters there first. It's simply not a necessity. It's not wrong if they do it that way, not at all, but it's not a necessity. And I think, yeah, having a show like Brewster Gold in the mix with all these other types of shows, I think that actually shows a lot of foresight. I don't know, Rob, what do you think? I completely agree with you. And remember, I mean, Booster Gold can either be a character that does remember the DC characters, so he has foreknowledge of the future, which could be interesting, or the future he comes from was destroyed and it doesn't exist, which is why he's stuck on Earth. All right, what's next? Raymond Verada says, think Jason Momoa can be Hercules with the Argonauts versus Amazons in Paradise Lost? Whenever you use the word could, the answer is always yes. Yeah, sure, yeah. it could, but highly, highly, highly unlikely. But yeah, possibly. All right, what's next? Reggie Phoenix says, congrats on the 10,000 views. What did you make about Gunn saying Cavill was jerked around by previous executives? We were talking about this before the show started. And yeah, we hit 11,000 live viewers today. Thank you to everybody who came by and, uh, and decided to join us. Big news day, obviously. Um, James Gunn, that wasn't the only thing he said. James Gunn was very critical of the previous regime. Uh, he never called out anybody by name, but one of the things to mention is that Henry Cavill got jerked around a lot by, like one of the things that I loved when James Gunn and Peter Safran took over that they s straight up had face-to-face -face conversations with a bunch of the principals involved and sat down and said, here's what's going on. They immediately sat down with Henry Cavill. They immediately sat down with, with Jason Momoa. They immediately sat down with Ben Affleck. They, they took these meetings and say, look, and they shot straight and say, here's what is happening. And they didn't jerk him around. They didn't do all that kind of stuff. And James Gunn was also very, very critical about how they handled the properties before, not just the individual performers. There's a lot in there to go into. And honestly, I think maybe he said a little too much. Uh, I, I don't think to build your future, you need to crap on the stuff that people did before, but maybe a little bit, bit of it was warranted. So it, it was nice to see him at least acknowledging that stuff. All right, what's next? Jay says, I like that there was no announcement of Justice League. Let the, um, let's build the world and then introduce the members. I, I don't agree. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm perfectly happy with the way they've announced this. I also would have been perfectly happy if they start up with, um, with Justice League. Now, everybody will say, well, John, it's different. It's not different. James Gunn did not need to do a solo Star-Lord, a solo Drax, a solo Gamora, a solo Rocket, and a solo group movie before doing Guardians of the Galaxy. He was able to come out of the gate, Guardians of the Galaxy. George Lucas didn't need a solo Han Solo movie, a solo Luke Skywalker movie, a solo Chewbacca movie before he did Star Wars. You could have easily launched with Justice League. And use the the big hit characters to bring in the lesser known characters and then branched off from that. But was that the only thing they could have done? No, 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 no. Them doing it this way is also going to be great, but I think it could have been fine either way. I think they've done something which is even smarter. They're giving you the authority, which is exactly, it is the Justice League done in a cheeky way by a different company originally. So you're going to get the bad Justice League and see where that goes and have our characters earn their status. Would you say they are the mirror universe in, you version know what? of Justice League? In a way, <laughs> in a, no, but that's that's very astute. I mean, in a way, they are. And and they're also great. They're setting them up as to do... They're villains. They're going to become villains. And they have to establish... You, you're going to tear down a Justice League before you can build it. And that's going to be even more interesting because within the world, the Justice League is going to have to be built by our heroes, which is going to be even more fun after they defeat these jackbooted thugs. All right, what's next? Although I love the authority. Uh, James Welsh says, no Penguin release date? Why? No Penguin, penguin release date? 
Why? <laughs> um, listen, that's television. A lot of times, like Netflix, Disney Plus, HBO Max, they don't actually announce or the. We know the general time frame that Penguin's coming, but uh, most of these TV things, they don't actually announce specific release dates. Sometimes, like in the case of Netflix, like six weeks prior to the series launching, so and it's not unusual. It predated their regime anyway. Yeah, but so, it, it's elsewhere. It still lives under elsewhere. that Elseworlds yeah, yeah. banner. Yeah. All right. What's next? Uh, Tevin Como says over under 60% Ant Ant-Man Q will make over $1 billion. Probably me. Yeah. Ant-Man quantum mania. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, z- I'll, I'll tell you right now. Zero. Ant-Man is not a billion dollar franchise. I love it. It's my second favorite sub series within the MCU after Captain America. I love it. Um, and the possibility exists with you bringing in um, thing, but if you look at the opening weekend projections and stuff like yeah. that, look, anything is possible. If it's like the greatest comic book movie ever made and it has legs like Avatar, I, I think the chances of it hitting a billion are quite low, though. I agree with you. It, it really this this probably not, but if it's as pivotal to the Marvel universe as I think it is, the possibility certainly exists because people are going to go back again and again. Well, anytime you put that Marvel logo on it, the possibility yeah, is for sure. I just right? think that they've hidden, they, they're keeping hidden a lot of what this movie's actually about. Right, but... I know. The marketing is what gets people out to the theaters. So, I mean, if it opens around $120 million, that's fantastic. It'll be by far the biggest opening that they've ever had in the franchise. Mm-hmm. But that's that's not numbers that gets you to a billion dollars. true. So. But hey, fingers crossed. I love Ant-Man. All right, what's next? I'm excited. The Geeky Unlimited says, I can almost hear the John Williams theme now. Or what? We don't know, but we love John Williams. So. Yeah, John Williams is Good great, sure. Out. You know what? I could see James Gunn going to John Williams and asking him for a new Superman. Well, listen. Oh, wow. That would be oh, great. Oh, the Superman theme, of course. Listen, John Williams has already, just recently, we talked about on the show, just recently said, a hey, uh, reports of my retirement a little bit exaggerated. Or, I want to keep making music. Maybe. Or asking him to do the theme for the DC Studios. Mm. Oh, yeah. That is. I could see that. You know? <laughs> bum, bum, like Marvels are bum, 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 yeah. bum, bum. Yeah, because I don't like yeah. the current one. Yeah, that no. little musical hit that plays in the uh, DC stuff. I, yeah. I mean, I would go to him now because why not get a Superman theme if you can, but DC Studios and an Elseworlds theme. Why not? All right. What's next? Raymond Verada sends in another 10, <clears throat> excuse me, sends in another $10 super chat and says, I remember the great John Schnepp was asking folks on Heroes live chat what comic should be made on film next. I mentioned the authority and he said he would be happy to see it. The authority is so good. I mean, especially when I first saw that comic, because the way they designed the panels, it was big. The panels were these huge widescreen panels. I'm going to go home and read my um, authority graph. I can't wait to go back and because I haven't looked at those in 10 years. And we knew characters like under James Gunn, the man who brought us Polka Dot Man. We knew we'd be getting some of these more outlier characters. And I think it's pretty exciting. All right. What's next? Uh, Nelson Alf- um, Alfaro says Peacemaker season two. Well, listen, the fact that the, the success of the first season of Peacemaker pretty much guarantees that they were going to do a second one. What they did say in the report was with James Gunn being completely tied up with Superman for the next little while, it has delayed. Uh, it's put Peacemaker season two on the shelf. They never said it wasn't happening. Let's see what happens with the Waller series. Like maybe they'll move away for it. Now, listen, John Cena's. He's not getting any younger. Like, like Dave Batista said, listen, a lot of things on this body are going to start to sag really quick. <laughs> the, the same thing is going to happen with Cena pretty soon because Cena is like freaking built like a brick house. But he is, he's approaching his 50s. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I fully expect we're going to get a Peacemaker season two, but you never know. All right, is that it? That's it. All right, guys, and that'll do it for today's elongated uh, episode of the John Campus Show. A lot of stuff to cover here today. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, guys. Click the thumbs up button on it. Leave a comment down below. All that good stuff, all of it helps our show out. And we're so glad that you decided to come by. Don't forget to come by for tomorrow's episode of the John Campy Show. We hope you guys will join us then. A little bit later today at 3 p.m., we've got an open mic. So we'll I'm sure we'll talk more about the, all the announcements that came out here today. Hopefully, you guys will come by and join us as well. So for everybody in the room, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett, Ray Orr has been back there, Taylor Gonzalez, Jonathan Voico, and of course, Aaron Cummings and little Joey Bishop. My name's John Campy, guys. Thanks so much for being here. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs>